Good evening. It's 7 p.m. and I'd like to call the January 27th school committee meeting to order. Um, we'll start with the uh, Pledge of Allegiance, led by Brad Austin. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag, United States of America, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Brad. Uh, we have this evening a consent agenda and uh, minutes from our January 13th meeting, as well as a uh, host of bills and payroll. Everybody we'll have a chance to take a look at those. Accept the motion to accept. Motion to accept. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. Thank you. This will be our first opportunity to hear from interested citizens. Do we have any yeah. folks in the audience or at home? Okay, so Shaker Lane participated in the virtual dance party hosted by the PTA last Friday. It was a really great success. The Shakerling community would like to give their thanks to the PTA for providing students with such a fun night. Shakerling is also taking part in the Great Kindness Challenge this week. So each day, students are challenged with a kind task and have like a fun spirit day. An example of a kindness challenge this week was to play with someone new at recess. And one of the spirit days was Kindness Ties Us Together, which is where students and staff were tied to school. <laughs> the students and staff at Shaker Lane also look forward to this Friday night's Shakey's Virtual Story Time where the PTA is sent home coloring pages and hot chocolate for students to enjoy while they listen to staff members read them a story at Shaker. At Russell Street, students also participated in the virtual dance party last Friday, and the students that attended had a really great time. The students and staff at Russell Street School had a Celtic Spirit Day last Friday in order to cheer on the Boston Celtics other games, so that was very exciting to do. And some of the classrooms at Russell Street are also taking part in the Great Kinds Challenge that's happening. Littleton Middle School participated in map testing yesterday, January 26th, and their next date for map testing is February 9th. So for those at the middle school or the parents that may be watching, make sure they judge their Chromebooks. And at the high school, there's a lot going on. The Townline Band Concert will take place on Tuesday, February 8th. The concert will be live streamed and later broadcast on LCT. The Littleton High School Band is also preparing <laughs> for their Disney trip over February break, and everyone's crossing their fingers that COVID numbers allow for the trip to proceed. Here's a coat drive that is ending tomorrow at Little High School. Um, so if you have any gently used coats, feel free to drop them off at the high school to be donated to those in need. On January 19th, the freshmen and sophomores watched a presentation about cyber safety, and the high school is very glad that those students were able to further their knowledge about internet safety. The school is also participating in Kindness Week, where students promised to prevent bullying, decorated their classroom doors, and are also having spirit weeks. <laughs> um, <laughs> happening right now at the high school, there is a junior college planning night in the auditorium. The meeting started at 6.30. And cool. good, yeah, yep. good luck to the juniors. Um, the DEI club at the high school is hosting movie night right now, also at the high school. It started at 6 p.m. It's in the Kiva. They are showing the movie Hidden Figures in our, and provided snacks and pizza to those in attendance. This is the first of hopefully many movie nights to come. The DEI club also started a petition to get Dwali recognized at Wilson High School as like a bigger holiday. Um, high school, the academic term also ends tomorrow, which means many students will be shifting to different school schedules and new classes. And so we would like to wish everyone luck for the next term. Excellent. Thank you very much, Stella. Uh, any yeah. questions from the school committee members? Discuss? Hearing none. And, yeah. and surprise. We will uh, we'll move right along. Thank you very much. Um, at this point in the meeting, we'll move along to our new business. We have um, public health metrics. I'd like to invite Katrina Wilcox Hagberg up to give us an we still have a recognition. Um, I'm so sorry. I mean, 
This is my first time. <laughs> Keeping really us good. on track. That's good. <laughs> That's good. Long time. Uh, I wanted to give the principals an opportunity to add anything that they may have for uh, events that are happening in their schools. So Stella did, as always, an incredible job. So if you don't have anything else to add, I feel that you need For those of you at home, just put up your hand if you'd like to speak. Michelle? Good evening, everyone. Um, I'll start at Shaker Lane. Just really quick, just one thing. Um, Shaker Lane staff have been working really hard. We've developed um, professional learning communities at every grade level. Um, we meet monthly during our staff meetings. Uh, each team chose a focus area that they wanted to improve for their students, um, low average, average, and high average students. Um, so they targeted an area that they would feel these students would benefit from in additional instruction. Preschool is focusing on a number of things based on their ability level. So the idea is that the students can identify their name. Some kids need to just identify a letter. Um, some are working to find the letters out of order. Some children are looking to find their name in a field of three, a field of five. So depending on their ability um, would be matched to the level that, that they are working on. Um, kindergarten and transitional are working on uh, focusing on letter ID and letter sound. Grade one is focusing on building accuracy, uh, children's reading accuracy, reading fluency, trick word recognition in order to increase their oral reading fluency. And grade two is focusing on reading fluency. So we're um, each month we meet, like as I mentioned earlier, and what the teachers are doing is targeting the instruction. And our first meeting where we're going to bring the, uh, the data in will be March. So we've still we've been building the um, the targets that we're going to work on. They've been building the interventions that they're going to be working on, leveling them for each group and implementing them. Their goal is to implement some strategies two times a week, three if possible. And we'll bring the data to the March meeting. We'll look at the pro student progress, readjust the targeted instruction, and then look at it again. And our goal is to just continue to increase and focus on an area that they felt was um, a, a focus for this year. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll take them in order. Yeah. Cheryl? Oh, good evening. Uh, I have a few things for Russell Street. Um, Russell Street uh, and Shaker Lane, additionally, uh, we're focusing on the um, Lucy Cockins writing curriculum. There's been in house training. Um, in both buildings um, for the writing curriculum at all grades. Um, at Russell Street, we um, have an emphasis this year on um, grade level teams. And while um, Russell Street has always, you know, functioned on third, fourth and fifth grade level teams, we, um, during the um, early days of the pandemic, we kind of you know, people had to kind of do their own thing and move away. Um, <clears throat> and so we've really moved back to this year to have a focus on the grade level teams and having teams really work together and collaborate together. Um, and that's been really nice. Um, yesterday, there was um, an opportunity for all of the teaching assistants to participate in um, a professional development in the afternoon with Jessica Minahan, and it was very well received. Um, they're very appreciative of those opportunities. And i um, Thank you certainly to Beth Steele for facilitating that. And also um, thank you to the PTA and LEF. <clears throat> we have a virtual anti-bullying, excuse me, anti-bullying presentation coming up. Um, it's called the Matt Wilhelm Show and he's a BMX bike rider. Um, and our students get to um, send in videos of questions and he will gear his presentation um, uh, individually for our school. And we'll have an opportunity to watch that presentation for an entire week when um, classes are ready to watch it. So um, our week is going to be the week before February vacation. So we're really looking forward to that. Absolutely, Brad. You mentioned, um, thanks for that report. You mentioned that you had PD yesterday with Jessica Minahan. Um, what was that about? The um, um, the teaching assistance had took place um, took. Uh, participated in the PD yesterday with Jessica Minahan. And it's really around classroom like um, management and behaviors and things like that. Um, we had had um, professional development with the teachers and staff had had professional development with Jessica Minahan prior. And she was so good that we invited her to come back to work specifically with teaching assistants who are often kind of at the forefront of helping with kids. 
So it was very well um, received yesterday by um, our staff. One of our, our district initiatives was to find ways in, in providing professional development opportunities for our assistants uh, that are quite often deal with our, our most vulnerable children. And, and uh, that's an area that, that seems to be lacking in most school districts. So we put on a couple of professional development opportunities for them this year, and we intend to, to continue to work with them and, and identify areas where they need to be. So very pleased that we're doing this first time, in, well, second time in our district that, that we've done this. And, and, you know, considering what we're dealing with this year with the pandemic, I'm just thrilled that we're able to bring presenters in and, and uh, work with our travel. I'll say, I think that's great, especially if this is going to reinforce the classroom management strategies that the classroom teachers are using. It's great that they're sharing um, resources. Thank you. Great. Thank right. you very much. I'll go next. We, um, at the middle school, just, just one thing that I want to highlight. We are in the process of planning and hosting our first live in-person kid event on February 11th, uh, our 7th and 8th grade kids night out. For those that are that are new to the middle school, we do the several times a year. Um, that it's you know it's basically a big activity night. We've got the gym open for soccer and basketball. We have the cafeteria open. We have games, fun, food. Um, it's all free admission. You know, normally we would charge five dollars in the past, but just given the the financial climate, we just felt like you know what we want everybody to be uh, have the opportunity to to join us. And so Friday, February eleventh, be the It'll be a, a great day in little, at Littleton Middle School because we'll be able to get together and, and, and have some fun for the first time in more than two years. So kids are excited about it. We're excited about it. And uh, we just hope the numbers stay low and allow this thing to, to continue on the path that, that we're on. So that's what we've got coming up at the middle school. That's great. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Good evening. So did a nice job of providing an overview of what's ahead and what we've just done, but I have a couple of additional details to provide. Um, this past uh, month, we had a virtual cyber safety presentation provided for parents and caretakers. And we also had, we also did virtually for grade nine and 10 in our flex block on a, a Wednesday. Uh, Well-received, but overdue. Most of something we wanted to do actually, we had scheduled right before uh, I think it was either a week or a month after we had it scheduled after, right before the closure, and uh, we had to cancel it, and, and then we postponed it again and again. So we did it. It's done. So we're happy to do that because that was a very important initiative for us. Um, I also want to thank Steve Mark for helping to facilitate a water fill with the water fill station replacement. We've had PTA has been instrumental in providing uh, water fill stations throughout the building, but one finally cracked. The tank is done. It's Maybe it's due to age, due to conditions, whatever. But um, that, that's going to be installed. It's, uh, students are looking forward to that. It's the one between the locker locker room, so it gets a lot of use outside the fitness room. That will be installed during February break. So I know students and committee will be happy to hear that. As part of the Great Kindness Challenge, we, we had some additional activities. One of them on Monday was a door decorating contest that brought a lot of fun to the building. Everybody, all the advisors are out and decorating there. The classroom doors. There was there was a, there was a prize. And there, um, and the winners were, at each grade level will have breakfast provided on Monday. That's going to be something for them to look forward to. Uh, also, with the Great Kindness Challenge, it's, it's worth mentioning some of the other activities. On Tuesday, it was give someone a compliment, step up for someone in need, lend a friend a something, Maybe even a pencil. It's the both that, but lend a friend something. Wednesday, post something kind on social media. Uh, write a thank you note or a note of appreciation and deliver it. Thursday, connect today. Connect with someone who has the same, the same or similar interest. Connect with someone who has an interest you don't know much about. And Friday, tomorrow, thank the people who support you every day. Offer to help someone create your own act of, crap, of kindness. So that's, you know, we'll conclude that this week. Uh, thank you to Jen Puto and Tracy Turner, who were instrumental bringing that and making us a great, helping to make us a great kindness um, recognized school district as well as uh, high school. The course selection process is getting underway, believe it or not, for next year as we conclude our first semester and point that out. Class will start new classes and start soon. Uh, in, in mentioning the new semester, we're excited to announce for students who are interested and who are availability in their schedule. We'll have new two new electives. One is theater arts um, and a financial algebra course, which 
heavy focus on financial literacy, something we wanted to really embed in the curriculum. We appreciate the superintendent's support to make that happen mid-year. It's unusual to be able to add a course, a couple of courses in. Uh, very grateful for the support of the uh, central office and the superintendent. And last but not least, believe it or not, the Disney trip is still on for Flora. <laughs> I've right. talked to Mrs. Bridge recently, so she's, you know, has the appropriate amount of apprehension in taking that number of students to the to Florida for the, for the, uh, the trip. Um, that was also, I think, postponed. I think we were supposed to do that a few years but then ago, and then we had to put it off. So they're going to make the trip uh, in February if all goes well. With the flights and arrangements, we're ready to go. So thank you to Mrs. Bridge for helping make that happen. That's it for high school. Terrific. Yeah. I have two uh, acknowledgements. We have a, another VAX clinic, vaccination clinic coming up on February 7th. Uh, some good news out of 110 slots that are available, we have 62 that are filled. So that's sending us a signal that we're, we're uh, soon to uh, finish our mission, so to speak. So that will allow people to uh, obviously walk in during that evening unless they fill up while I'm speaking. <laughs> and uh, we, we still have another one scheduled for February 28th. Uh, at this point in time, I anticipate that'll be the last clinic that we'll offer. And if we see a need later on, we'll certainly organize some others. But it's really nice to be at that point. I, I knew we were going to get there. And, and uh, you know, January, getting into February, and we're, we're almost there. So I'm very proud of our community and uh, proud of our partnership with the town to, to make this happen. I'd also, on behalf of the administration and uh, staff, like to thank the number of parents that reached out to us last week uh, and offered to provide breakfast for, for all staff on Friday. I mean, we have a lot of staff. It's a, it's a huge undertaking. Uh, it was so well received. We're, we're, you know, we're very grateful for, for what, our, what our families did for, for all of the staff. Uh, as I said, it was so well received. It just, it just boosted everybody up. And, uh, they also uh, left uh, letters uh, that had many, uh, many words of, of uh, motivation, so to speak, and, and, uh, and this, it was just so touching, so so incredibly kind. So, thank you to our community. Uh, we, we greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Any, Tim, you had a question? Yeah, I just, going back to the water filling stations. Mm -hmm. um, I know that this might be something came up in my house this week. My son forgot his water bottle, uh -huh. and there's no bubblers now because of the whole cold. Mm -hmm. Is there a way that we can do cups? And, do we have do we have things for students to use in all the schools? Because I know we have water filling stations in all the schools. And I know we're not. Um, okay. The nurses have water bottles in the in the nurses office, so if the student doesn't have um, a water bottle to fill the filling station, they can go to the nurses office and get a water bottle. <laughs> Thank you. I, I knew someone would. I was like, you should have went to the office. <laughs> uh, all right. So that's good to know. It's out there. Yeah. It's so it's just so that the, there's not a run on the nurse's station. <laughs> 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 yeah, we don't need you know, just to kind of maintain the, right. the herd uh, or, you know, the, yes. manage it. Um, so what I'd like, you know, we, we, we get that. thank you for bringing that to our attention. We'll talk about it, see what we can do to sort of remedy that for kids who have on a day that they're right. And it may not just be your school. It might be yeah, school right. school yeah, that they idea. forget their yeah. water bottle. a connection with the cafeteria would be yeah. probably the way we want to handle it. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We'll bring you some home. Okay. Thank you. Great. Good question. Um, any, any others? No? Okay. Um, yeah, I'll just say thanks very much for sharing everything that's going on. Um, I thought the virtual like dance party thing, I think that maybe like spawned out of COVID. I think that that's still fun. Um, but Jason, I was glad to hear that you're having an in-person um, student event that's going to likely take place indoors because we're in the wintertime. So that's terrific. Um, and I recognize the fact that probably a, a dance party in person among like K-2 students probably wouldn't work as well. They wouldn't. So um, I, I just think it's great that we have both going on. I had a question for Dr. Harrington related to the to what's happening on those different days in terms of the kindness stuff and the social media posting. Do you have a sense for like what level of participation or engagement um, the student body had during activities like that? I'd have to check in with the teachers, the advisory teachers specifically. You know, 
but they're also doing it in tandem with some spirit activities where they actually they bring attention to it. Like Wednesday was peace, love, and kindness. Wear a tie dye t shirt. Um, uh, Tuesday was interesting. Words that can't be taken back. Wear your shirt backwards. I saw a lot of that. That was very <laughs> noticeable. Speaking <laughs> with teachers, like having the tie on the back of their neck. So some of it was like bit visual. Tomorrow is Tiger Pride Day, so that will be very visible. Um, there, today was fashion favorites. Share your interest by wearing a shirt with your favorite sports team or band or other interests. So you can see the, that's visible to me when I'm walking the halls. Mm -hmm. the, the Monday was very engaging, very actively involved. Lots of participation in the door decorating. Um, as far as the, I didn't look at, I don't know about social media. I haven't checked on that, yeah. but I'd have to check in with the advisory teachers on that. Yeah, I'd be curious. Thank you. Charlotte, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, I think the spirit dress up things definitely are getting more participation than the actual kindness like activities that are being asked. Mm -hmm. um, but like the social media ones, um, I didn't see anyone posting about like be kind or anything like that. <laughs> um, and I think. I don't know, the spirit days themselves are definitely getting more participation than the actual kindness challenges themselves. Mm -hmm. That's been my observation. Yeah. A lot of them are private. If you notice when I think back to what we said, like, you know, it's uh, some of them are some, you know, write someone a thank you note or do something like that. So it might be something that they quietly do and they don't want. I actually appreciate and admire that more if they do it without notice and attention or looking for recognition for it. Sure. Um, so, but we'll have, we should uh, find out just by. The easier way is to have the advisory teachers next week to take a poll of, you know, how many people did this one? <laughs> sure. Yeah. yeah. And, and even if even if they didn't, it's at least like bringing the awareness about it. Just, yeah. You know, that, that check-in. So I can appreciate all that stuff. Thank you. I am uh, prepared to turn the meeting back over to Matt if you give me a nod here. Oh, good. Good to go. I, I will let you know that I did botch the agenda. So I made a mistake <laughs> in your absence. <laughs> We are, uh, we've Very just fine. concluded recognition. So we're at new business item number one. Awesome, thank you. All right, uh, that brings us to public health metrics. Katrina Agberg is here to give us an update on what's going on in town. I have to say the uh, Russell Street Shaker Lane dance party was a lot of fun and our entire family participated <laughs> despite the fact that I only have one Russell Street kid. <laughs> it was great. <laughs> we had an alumni there. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we want to just go to the trend, please. Slide and by flail, just get me back. Give you three feet. Sounds great. Um, so here's that overview slide that we are not on. <laughs> Sorry, too quick on the keyboard. All right, can we go back to the front? <laughs> Wasn't planning to skip that back. All right, here we go. Um, so these are the state data from the DPH as of today. Um, as you can see, cases are in an awesome decline at the moment. Um, the current level is just above the peak from last winter. So we still have a lot of COVID around, but it's definitely not where we were three weeks ago, two weeks ago. Um, if you look at test positivity, it has also declined. We're at 9.5% at this point. Um, so just under that 10% where we think we're missing a lot of um, spread. So we still have a lot of spread. We probably are not counting everyone. We know that, but um, it's getting better. And hospitalizations appear to have crested. And if everyone could knock on wood right now, that would be awesome. Um, last two days, we've been slightly lower. So now we're at 2,800 cases in the hospital a day. Um, and deaths are still increasing at this point. That is our lagging indicator. It will come, will be the last one to decline. And it's at this point, it's at 61 per day. Still lower than last winter, thanks to that. If you go to the next slide, um, this is the case rates by age group. Um, this is actually for the entire time that the DPH has reported them since October of 2020. Um, the rates for all age groups remain higher than at any other point that they've been during the pandemic, but this is the first week they have declined since Omicron hit. So this is Thankful that all age groups are going down at this point. Um, the 5 to 9, 10 to 14, 0 to 4, 15 to 19 all seem to be the highest, but that's also where we're doing testing in school still currently, so that might um, reflect some of that. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, two slides, yep. So this is the number of cases reported in Littleton for the period of January 9th to 22nd. 
Um, Littleton had 219 cases reported during that two-week period, which is thankfully a decline from the prior two reporting periods. So we are, again, looking like the state coming down. So go to the next two slides for now. So this is where we aggregate the data for multiple towns so we can compare what Littleton's doing, how we're, we're doing compared to the areas around us. Um, thankfully, we're all mirroring each other, mirroring the state. We, um, Littleton's average daily incidence rate this last two-week period, which is January 9th to the 22nd, was 160 per 100,000, which is lower than it was last week and the week before. Um, and all the other areas also are trending down in similar amount and a similar range. So we're all kind of the same. Um, if you look at the right, that's the test positivity. Remember, that's the total number of positive tests divided by the total number of tests conducted. That's not a proportion of people, that's a proportion of testing. Um, we had Littleton recorded 1,600 tests conducted, which is actually a little bit lower um, than we've been experiencing the last couple of weeks. And um, test positivity this last two week period was 14.7%, which was lower um, than we've had for the last two reporting periods. So we're at above 10%, which gives us the clue that we are missing cases in our numbers. So that 219 is probably a little higher and we're just, our data is not um, capturing all the cases. We go to the next one. This is the school data. Um, our nurses, again, are continuing to rock it and um, doing a great job recording all of these for us. So these are the cases reported as of today um, for that last week. So, so far this week, we've had 34 cases with one day to go in the reporting period, which averages around um, six, five to six cases a day for this week. Um, the last week was 66, the week before that was 95, so we are trending down in a really nice pattern, which mimics the town and mimics the state too. Um, so, and it seems to be similar for maybe all the schools except maybe the middle school. Middle school is a little higher than the other schools this week, whereas Russell Street was higher last week. So something's kind of moving through each of those schools, I guess. Um, but again, it's not it's not the 23 we had two weeks ago, it's 17. So hopefully we're not having a large number for the middle school front. Keep going. This is the vaccination coverage for Littleton. This is again that fully vaccinated. We've got two doses of an mRNA vaccine or one dose of a J and J. Um, Right now, the proportion of fully vaccinated residents in town is 85 by 86 percent, with another nine or 10 percent um, partially vaccinated and four percent who have not started vaccinations yet. Um, our five to 11 year olds um, are still amazing. I'm really impressed with them becoming eligible at the beginning of November. 72 percent of our five to 11 year olds here in town have reached fully vaccinated status, and another 19 percent are partially vaccinated. And I think this is in, this is rapidly increased over the last two months. And I think it's a large part due to having access to new clinics because it's been really hard for others who are looking elsewhere to get appointments. This brought it to town, this made it quick. Hopefully we can do the same when zero to fours become eligible sure. um, for vaccines just to help them out too. And um, so hopefully over the next couple of weeks, those 19% who are partially vaccinated will join the fully vaccinated category. And actually, I was looking at this since the um, beginning of August when we kind of re reconvened for um, this school year. There was the town was at 72% um, fully vaccinated. And so we've been up to 86% now, and every age group has increased over the last five months. So every group has improved, which is great. And then looking at the next slide, this is our vaccination boosters. Um, Approximately, so you don't, you're not eligible for a booster until five months after your second mRNA vaccine or two months after the J&J. So what I've done is take those that are five months out to try, try to figure out who's eligible. So if 84% of Littleton's fully vaccinated population are now eligible for their booster. And of that, 72% of eligible residents have already been boosted, which is a great start. Um, there's nearly, or there's just over 1,800 residents who are eligible, but not yet boosted. Um, I'm gonna come back to this at some of my later slides, just keeping this in mind. So there's still work to be done, like getting people, parents, let them know they can have some of these extra spots maybe in the clinics um, that are coming up, that would be a great way to 
there, you know, there's a great way to get some more people into shots and arms. Boosters help keep protecting people and keep um, our rates in check the next month. All right, so I'm moving into the kind of public health messaging piece. Um, the Center for Disease Control has updated their guidance on types of masks. And I think I've been saying this for a year at the point. The better quality and fit mask you wear, the more protection you have. So um, if you the respirator, which you get fixed, you know, get tested if your highest uh, amount of personal protection is in your fan 95 respirators, which is kind of like the one I'm wearing. Your disposable masks with square ones might have more gaps so they're a little less protected. Layer a cloth mask over it, it might fit better. Cloth masks are um, the least protective just because they have um, more holes in them, I guess you could say. And then um, a mask that you don't wear correctly, you don't wear it all, definitely. So just there's a range, a spectrum of protections when you think of masks. And the federal government is in the process of making masks, um, N95 or masks available to the public. They'll be coming into uh, pharmacies, I believe, and some other, um, I think it's coming through their vaccine progression. I'm pretty sure it's coming to pharmacies soon that you can go and get free N95s for free. And then the next slide is there's some really good news for um, vaccines at this point. And given that we've had um, almost three months now of experience with the five to 11 vaccinations, I thought it was a good time for an update I know people um, were concerned about jumping right on board for vaccines and how safe they were, how effective they are um, for this age group, and I totally respect that. So I wanted to come back and provide the first lens of safety data that uh, has been uh, seen. Um, so this is using that BEARS and Be Safe reporting the CDC um, uses and for the period of November 3rd to December 19th. During that time, 8.7 million doses have been administered in the US, and 97% of those reports um, that came from the VAERS and the VSA system were not serious. They may be related to administration errors or um, things that you expect from like short-term vaccine reactions, such as fever, headache, vomiting, the things we experience when we get our vaccine, the kids sometimes do too. And 28% uh, of those um, reports actually said there were no adverse events. So some kids don't even have a reaction at all. Um, so there were concerns about some serious adverse events and in particular myocarditis was um, pointed out with the 12 to 15s and so that was something that they definitely dove into looking for specifically um, it's myocarditis is rare but it's serious and it's been associated with the vaccine um, in the older age group so and the rates appear to be highest in males especially 12 to 19. so to date um, but again that's rare even among the 12 to 19 um, to date, myocarditis among the 5 to 11 year olds appear also to be rare with only 11 verified reports out of the 8.7 million doses administered. And um, the, these safety assessments are going to continue to be ongoing. Um, but these re results kind of provide the top line first look, um, a lot of confidence in the safety of these vaccines for the 5 to 11 year olds and how they appear for the rest of the population who also had them and have them for a long time. This is, this is good news. So if you have questions that's still about the safety of these vaccines for your kids, I really encourage you to reach out to your pediatrician to ask every question you have um, if you're still thinking about it. And then the um, other thing that's come out is, I know we keep hearing with Omicron, it feels like everyone has it, doesn't matter if they're vaccinated or not. Um, we've heard about a lot of vaccinated people who've had infections in the last few weeks, so I know that people feel like the vaccines aren't working. They're just not working, it's just not worth it. But it's really not true. Um, the, the vaccines are working well to reduce um, the number of infections, prevent hospitalizations, and death, even against Omicron. So these are graphs from the NYC Health, um, their public health agency through 1-9. And the, the shaded area is actually when Omicron was present in New York City. And these curves show us that unvaccinated people, who are the purple curves, are far more likely to test positive for COVID than vaccinated people, which are the orange line. And then um, unvaccinated people are also far more likely to be hospitalized and to die. So if you look closely, you can also see that the curve started to bend down already for vaccinated people, where they continue to head up still for um, unvaccinated people. So these vaccines are working. You know, I know they may, you may have breakthroughs that are mild and you can handle at home, but these are, they're still 
providing you protection from the most severe things that are happening. And also, for, if you're not infected, you can't spread, you can't get long COVID. So just vaccines, stay up to date on your vaccines. So if you go to the next slide, um, this was actually pointed out to me at the Board of Health meeting last night, and I think it's important to know about. So I'm just going to quickly mention that um, the state actually updated the isolation and quarantine guidelines with a lot more detail um, than they have had since late December. So this, when you are infected with COVID-19, with COVID you need to isolate. Put the two eyes together. If you're infected, you isolate. Um, and the isolation, if you notice, if you go to their website, if you search the COVID isolation quarantine guidance for general public, you'll get all the details. I'm just giving the overhead right now. Um, you'll notice that these are isolation guidelines are stratified by whether the individual is able to mask or not. So, uh, and that mask is, can they, um, or is this individual able to consistently wear a mask for the young, too young to, or medical or behavioral conditions to prevent them from doing so. So that will, um, depending on which group you fit in, you have different considerations to take for protecting your um, others around you. So that is there if you are a case and you need to um, refer to it. And the next slide is the quarantine guidelines. So when you are exposed to someone with COVID-19, you need to quarantine. Um, or you may not do, depending on your vaccination status. So if you look at these guidelines, when you go into them, they're stratified not only on are you able to mask or not, but they're also stratified on whether you're up to date with your vaccine or not. So up to date, the states define the up to being up to date with your vaccines is whether you've gotten um, your vaccines. And if it's been more than five months for an mRNA vaccine, more than two months for a J and J that you've gotten your booster. So keeping up with the pattern that you're supposed to be vaccinated on. Um, I do know that there is some differences about this when you look at early childhood education and when you look at um, Jesse, things like that. So there are considerations for the age group that you guys are serving. So the nurses are still the best person to call if you have questions. Um, but if you are not up to date on your vaccines right now, it would be a good idea to get into that booster clinic, get your booster, and then you're up to date not to think about it again. Um, but again, talk to your nurse if you have questions. And then as I end my, um, I know looking at this week's data, I feel a lot of relief. Uh, when I see these cases coming down and the hospitalization is pressing. Um, and it may seem like we're in the clear, but it's um, it's important to remember that when you're in a curve, like you have as many cases coming down as you have coming up. And so there's a lot of people who are still yet to be infected if our curve is symmetrical. So um, that means our chances of being exposed to COVID are still really high right now, higher than last January. And even if it's getting smaller, it's getting smaller every day but it's still present with us. So we still have a little bit of COVID to work through, I guess, before we're kind of in the clear. Um, and we also need to be aware that cases may not continue to fall in as fast as they have. For example, the UK and South Africa, both who are weeks ahead of us in their Omicron curves, now have shoulders to their curves. They've kind of plateaued um, and their descent has slowed considerably. So some of that is timing of their year, things that are happening, mitigations they've we're doing and are not doing anymore. So there's a lot of reasons for that, but just we're not there yet. We're not through that clear, we're past this state. So as when I as I want to end with this slide tonight, I want to just remind us about that Swiss cheese. Again, um, all of these layers of mitigation, none of them are perfect, but when they work together when they're layered. And, and I have to say we here our schools have successfully used these tools to provide in-person learning for the last 18 months. So we've got opportunities for our kids to be in person to do things when we use them. And we have so many more tools now than we had 18 months ago, and we even had six months ago. So, and we have better tools now than we've had even just two months ago. So like we have so many things that are working for us if we use these tools in this transition period, as we're trying to like work our way through, um, we know these tools work when we use them, but if we don't use them, they won't work. So keep that in mind as we enter the next few weeks. And, hopefully get past this, uh, the rest of this week. Thanks, Katrina. Appreciate that. But any questions from members of the board, Brad? I do. Um, Katrina, I appreciate that. Uh, you just mentioned that you know, the tools we have 
um, boosted fully, what are not, I don't know what the new phrase is, up to date, up to date um, seems to be the most um, effective um, tool we have. And I just want to check my math. You said, I saw 84% of town residents are eligible. Of those 84%, 74% are, have been boosted. Yes. Yeah. Which, in my math, it's about 63% are boosted. In the town. Yeah, it's a little bit. Yeah. That's a really good number. Really, it's a great number. But I just want to thank the town for that. It's part of what we're dealing, we're dealing with the schools. We're thinking about community health. Sixty-three percent of the community being boosted is um, yeah. is an incredible number. And our elders who have been eligible for boosters for much longer, their proportion is higher for their age groups than for the ones who are just more recent. However, I have to say, our twelve to fifteen year olds just became eligible at the beginning of January, and they're fifty percent boosted already. So. Um, and our 16 to 19 year olds are 71 percent boosted. So as an age group, so our our town is continuing to do great on getting their vaccinations and trying to stay up to date. There's still a little more work to do, a little more outreach to let people know about them. Um, but it's it's we're doing a good job. We're doing a good job, and there are opportunities. That's where the Vax Clinic yes. and stuff um, can help us. Keep I have to say on. that is the best thing is having the access and making it easy. That's I think what's been our success. Thank you. Okay. Moving on, our next agenda item is Dr. Crunchy and in the snow. Give us an update on changes to COVID in COVID nineteen individual testing within the district. I can I can tee it off before when starts. Uh, as I as we mentioned at a previous meeting, we knew that there were going to be changes coming. Uh, the way we look at mitigating. COVID is changing with, with more data coming in. The, the changes that are, are being made is definitely advantageous to continuing to control COVID as much as we can, but, but also moving forward with uh, offering enhanced educational experiences for our students. So we are in the process of uh, getting everything done and ready to go to offer a, a different form of testing for students and staff. It's an opt-in approach. It's not mandatory, it's recommended, but uh, we uh, will have available to us uh, rapid take-home COVID tests for uh, every student and staff member uh, on a weekly basis and until the end of the school year. Uh, we're really excited about that. Uh, with that comes some uh, relaxation in, in terms of contact tracing. So, again, uh, good things are happening. We, we knew as, as data was coming in, we would we would find some trends that, that would be advantageous in terms of what we're trying to do to return uh, schools to as normal as, as we can. So, I'm excited that we're able to present this this evening. Uh, after tonight, we wanted to, to make sure we presented it in public before we continue to move forward. And we also wanted some input from the school committee as well. So uh, with that, Lynn, I'm going to turn it over to you. And if I need to interject every now and again, I, I certainly will. Sure thing. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Um So as Dr. Clenchy said, we have another exciting change to Desi's testing program. Next slide. So um, the next slide, with over 2,000 schools that participate in some form of DESE's uh, current testing program this year, for example, symptomatic testing, routine tool testing, and testing stay, there is robust data on the prevalence of COVID-19 in schools. These data are overwhelmingly strong and support that schools are safe environments for teaching and learning. Students and staff throughout the state individually identified as asymptomatic close contacts in who repeatedly tested in school through the test and state program, tested negative over 90% of the time. As of January 9th, 2022, 503,312 test and state tests have been conducted and 496,440 of them were negative, which is 98.6%. Test positivity rates in test and state indicate that individuals identified as close contacts in schools are very unlikely to contract or spread COVID-19. So it's um, important to know that these data show that transmission from close contacts is a rare occurrence in schools and that therefore extensive contact tracing and associated test and state procedures are not adding significant value as a mitigation strategy despite the demand they place on the time of school health staff and school staff at large. Um, as a result, DESI is recommending that school health personnel increase their focus on 
identifying symptomatic individuals rather than monitoring in school close contacts who are unlikely to contract or spread the virus. The new set of testing options, which includes a weekly at home test for participating staff and students, will uniquely support this shift in focus. Other New England states, such as Connecticut and Vermont, have recently transitioned from individualized contact tracing to the use of at home tests and focusing on school health efforts and symptomatic testing. So on January 18th, the uh, DESI and the Executive Office, Office of Health and Human Services and the Department of Public Health announced an update to the COVID-19 testing program for districts and schools. So specifically, districts and schools participating in symptomatic and or school testing may choose to continue those testing strategies and discontinue contact tracing and test and stay. As an additional resource, districts and schools that elect to make this change will be provided with rapid antigen at-home tests for all participating staff and students that may be used on a weekly basis and tests will be provided to any individual who opts in. Middleton will continue to participate in pool testing and symptomatic testing. Our isolation protocols are still in effect for positive cases. One other note is that um, one of the stipulations of the program is if you have had COVID in the past 90 days, you may opt into the program but will be exempt from receiving a test for the 90 day window. Um, and until once you are outside of the 90 day window, you just start receiving your um, test every other week. So districts and schools may elect to switch to the updated testing program beginning on January 21st, 2022. And so districts and schools that respond affirmatively by January 21st will be prioritized, for, prioritized to start the updated program. Um, we did respond affirmatively prior to January 21st. So the at-home incident tests will be provided on a staggered basis with the delivery of tests to staff and students occurring on alternating weeks. And districts that responded by January 21st will begin receiving tests for staff during the week of January 24th. We have received our shipment of staff tests this week. And um, the tests for students will be delivered during the week of January 31st. At home tests for staff members and students will be provided again in all the weeks. So just to review some of the implementation details, we will still continue to provide symptomatic testing and routine pool testing. Um, and so the original, if you stay with the original program, nothing would change. We are moving to the updated testing program. Um, we will no longer participate in test and stay, and we will discontinue contact tracing for in-school exposures once um, students start receiving their tests. Weekly at-home antigen testing, as I said before, the shipment for staff has already come in. We've already placed the order for students um, operating under the assumption that the majority of the students will opt in and we're able to adjust those numbers going forward if we need to reduce, but we wanted to be able to stay within the timelines and, and get this program going. And as usual, DESI provides very ambitious timelines for us. Um, One thing that, that Lynn noted, <clears throat> excuse me, I think it warrants uh, repetition is that with, with the new program, they're, they're not recommending antigen tests if somebody contract COVID after, after day six, which is interesting because typically with an antigen test, you test negative at, at the end of, of, of the COVID transmission cycle. So it's, it's kind of a change that was a bit perplexing to it. So in PCR, you do a test positive for up to 90 days, but not with an antigen test. So that one uh, was a surprise. Yeah, and I think um, because it's the, the DNA versus um, looking at work, well, we need to go. I was just going to say the type of test is it really looks at the active infection and, and the lower viral viral load, and I think that um, I guess what's contributing to that is that there still is some viral load that you may still pop positive, um, but not be infectious. Um, so just to go on to the next slide, the at home antigen tests that will be distributed are the eye health tests. These are the tests that, that um, were distributed by some communities throughout Massachusetts to, um, to individuals. And they, these are the same tests that we were able to distribute to staff before um, we came back to school after the winter, winter break. For symptomatic testing, we will continue to use our Binex, um, our Binex now tests. And then we will still continue to do our routine pool testing. We're going to continue with doing the second swab. We do feel like because that's PCR based, that's helpful um, in that um, 
We will do, be doing lab-based follow-up testing, but we also will continue to do reflex testing if there's a positive pool the day following, because we are still finding that there's a delay in receiving um, the second swab results. So the update to the quarantine guidelines, districts and schools that select the new testing program will discontinue individualized contact tracing. There's no longer the expectation that close contact will be identified and therefore potential contacts do not meet quarantine. Instead, again, schools should shift their focus to monitoring symptomatic individuals. DESE and DPH are soon going to update protocols for responding to COVID-19 scenarios um, in their guidance to reflect these changes. So just one quick note about contact tracing. It will be discontinued except under a few, uh, some, some rare circumstances at the discretion of building an administration in collaboration with the school nurse. So for example, Individuals who are severely immunocompromised, students or staff, um, for instance, if they're currently related, um, receiving treatments, if there's an impact to school safety. So the principals and the school nurses will, will um, collaborate on that to determine if there's specific cases that we need to continue to trace for. Um, we will continue to trace until the, the tests are um, being provided to the students. And one note about that too, this is the same protocol that we had when, um, with the flu for severely immunocompromised. We do contact trace in those cases too. It just wasn't as publicized as, as COVID. Um, so it's recommended that districts and schools maximize the use of the at-home tests by determining which day of the week they recommend participating staff and students will take the test. We will be sending out a letter tomorrow that will have the recommended days to test. But for um, example, a, student that, um, a school that conducts weekly routine pool testing on Monday would likely recommend students and staff to undertake the at-home test on Thursdays. Um, if you are pool testing on Thursdays, it would be recommended that you administer the um, at-home test on Sunday evenings, Monday morning. Um, and at this time, the school will not be required to report the results of the at-home test to DPH, but districts and schools will continue to include positive at-home tests in their weekly testing reports to them. Okay, so just to summarize the next steps, I'll go back to, again, the ambitious timeline that he gave us. We had a, a webinar yesterday on this. Um, and so by January 21st, interested districts submit a free survey to DESE. We did complete that. Between January 18th and 21st, uh, districts and schools determine how many staff will participate in the at-home antigen test option. We do have enough for all of the, the staff in the district um, on hand. And um, we did send that information to DESE in our survey. So during the week of January 24th, just this week, um, it suggested that districts will respond affirmatively to the survey, will begin to receive tests. We did already receive those tests. By January 28th, districts will collect opt-in forms from interested families. We will be sending ours out tomorrow. We wanted to give this opportunity for us to have um, a conversation and discussion and get feedback. Um, and then during the week of January 31st, districts will begin to receive tests for participating students. We also have submitted that order um, as well. So we, we didn't want there to be delays um, working under the assumption that the majority is going to um, is going to opt in. So we have we will have uh, tests for all of the students in the district. And then we will just continue to place those, those orders in subsequent weeks. Yeah. Lynn, thanks. Yeah, a question. I, I had an earlier slide. I don't have to go back, but I'll, I'll just read it. Um, it was kind of one of the intro slide. You said that, um, actually, maybe go back. <laughs> it's like the second, yeah, it's the second slide. So it starts with review of statewide. The second bullet says that students and staff throughout the state identify as asymptomatic close contacts for repeatedly tested school, test and stay. Test negative over 90% of the time. Yes. And then there's another data point that says actually, <laughs> those students tested uh, tested negative 98.6% of the time. So I'm wondering what the difference is between those two numbers. Why say that over 90% and then the actual number was 98.6%? Is there a difference or just? Well, I, the, the second number is localized data, whereas the first number is uh, goes, goes beyond localized data. So the second number is. I think the second number is through 
January 9th, and they no. didn't know how that number right. might change. Okay. So then they knew that Correct. by the time the presentation date came, yeah. it would certainly well okay. be over 90%, but they weren't sure. Right. Yeah. So I just yeah. think it's worth pointing out that the act, I mean, because there's a huge difference. Closer to 100 than it's 90. It's much closer to 100. It's much closer to 99% than it is 90% to yeah. say that one out of every 10 tests would you know, positive versus test and state, none. test and state test. test and yep. State. So yeah. when you select right. the pool, um, chances are there's only going to be, you know, one or two positives at the pool, but we test the whole pool. So the majority right. of those right. come right. back. And that got tweaked a little bit because we modified our pool size um, when Omicron really skyrocketed. So it's hard to really look at that as a constant because we were recommended to um, decrease our pool size down to two per pool. So it's it's hard a hard number to, to really crunch, but what we can say is most of our test and state tests come back negative. The vast majority. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I just also want to say, like, this is a huge, I think this is a huge step in the right direction. I want to thank Dr. Clenchy and you, Ms. Snow, uh, for running with this as soon as the, you know, the news came out. Um, I think it brings us, first of all, it takes a huge burden off of school administration, the nurses, it doesn't let them get back to what they really need to be doing. Um, it brings us a, a really a large step back toward normalcy. Um, and I just think this is, again, I am very appreciative of the district for just running with this. So thank you. Yeah, so just basically patient and flexible with us because we did run with it and we did want to be, you know, right out of the gate. We were one of the early adopters for the DESE's um, pool testing program. But, you know, with anything, this is like pool testing version 2.0. We are rapid fire trying to figure out the logistics to this mm-hmm. and the distribution of it, which... It, there is a lot of logistics, so ultimately it's going to reduce the burden, but it definitely has isn't going to in the next couple of weeks. So um, I encourage parents to to give us feedback and to you know communicate with us. But um, we I had a meeting with the nurses yesterday. They had wonderful, great ideas. We had a productive meeting, and we think we have a, a pretty well mapped out game plan that will really be solidified over the next week. Yeah, and the, the Shaw Foundation was very helpful to districts throughout the, the state of setting up uh, Google Forum, et cetera, that we could access, which, which saves us a lot of time. Mm-hmm. So I appreciate the, the, the state support that, that everybody has right here. Any other questions? Go ahead, Sure. Um, I'll echo what Jen said and say thank you very much for running with this. When I when I, I watched, I know I sound like a COVID or school committee dork, but when I watched the um, Commissioner Riley and the Governor Baker press conference with the release here, you know, they made a big point to say Massachusetts was a leader with the test and stay program. Uh, and we opened school with test and stay and we saved so many in-person days with that program. And now the landscape of COVID has changed and it's time to adapt and change again. And, um, and this is in consultation with medical experts and, and this is the way of the future. For now, until things change again, um, and I just wanted to point out, because other like I believe it's Connecticut and Vermont, and Vermont that already have this in play. Yep. So it's you know we're not the first, but we're, we're it's still cutting edge, and it's it's a wonderful thing. So thank you for grabbing the bull by the horns and just running with it. And and right now the plan, the program is projected to go until April. Um, you know, as we know, changes may, you know, may come or may happen, but we've also shown that we're really good at adapting <laughs> and being able to um, make changes as we need to. So, yeah, it is exciting. And I think, you know, without jinxing anything, if not being on wood, I mean, this is, this is a clear indication that we're, we should have a pretty strong finish to the school year and, and maybe... I hate using a strong word like eradicate, but uh, the, the vocabulary of hybrid is the hope. I'm, I'm feeling you know, very optimistic that, that we should be able to, to finish the year with our students in school and, and as the year progresses toward the end, we should continue to, to make steps forward to return to as, as much to, to normal as possible. Now, again, there, there are caveats, I mean, but the, the trends that we see in the modeling that we see are pretty positive at this point. Good. Yeah, thanks for this, Lynn. And again, as I said, appreciate y'all, y'all jumping up. I guess you don't need our approval to do this, but you have it if you needed it. Um, I guess my question is, is this. My understanding is that this will allow us, allow our students to be tested twice a week if they opt in, right? They can be tested in the pool testing and then again on Thursday. 
Um, are, is there any, and I'm suggesting there should be, but is there any kind of reporting mechanism or any kind of verification that the district will use to see if the students are actually using the test in five? So we, um, parents will be provided a, um, a Google form link and to be able to report positive results, which will make it really, really easy. Um, and, you know, we hope that we'll make it as easy as possible for parents to, to report results using the weekly acclimated tests. And we'll assume that the, the absence of the positive report is evidence that there that there is a negative result, right? That so would be the assumption. Okay. So my other question is, is I, I really, really appreciate the ways in which this can free up time and some of the burden on our school nurses. I did notice one of the slides that they're kind of seeking out people who may be symptomatic. Sniffles and coughs are, are really prevalent. Um, and if it's on the nurses to find all the sniffling, coughing students um, and test them, I wonder if we're trading one burden for another, or is We this... already do symptomatic testing. Okay, yeah. right. So yeah. we're, okay. And it's mostly the teachers that are, are yeah. noticing the, the symptomatic that then come down to the nurse, and it's yeah. really easy for us to, to rapid test them. So I, I love that we still have the symptomatic testing available, if, you know, if needed, so that then we can determine, is that sniffle? Mm -hmm. COVID or, or not. And our nurses have two and a half years of experience dealing with it, so they're they're really good at identifying symptoms that, that they need to take serious. Sure. I, I, I just noticed this a bullet point and didn't know if that was new yeah. or not. I don't I like this. Thank you. And Lynn, that hasn't changed the where you have the bowl and the unbolded symptoms, and if you're vaccinated, right. it's just the bowl. Mm -hmm. Like that has made that's been consistent for a while now, correct? Yeah. So, so okay. Desi and DPH are, are providing us with updated protocols and flowcharts, but I I haven't heard that there's going to be a, a change in um, the symptom tracking. Okay. Thank you. We'll move on to the status of our Littleton Middle School attestation form that we applied for. So I set that up to uh, this week is flowing by. Mm -hmm. On January 25th, uh, I received the approval. So uh, we're uh, in a good situation with our middle school as well. We obviously met the threshold for vaccination rate. And uh, when we get to that point in time, we're, we're certainly ready to have a discussion about max flexibility at the middle school as well. Great. Uh, where do you think we stand with, so logically we're just going to continue down the path here, where do you think we stand with Russell Street? Well, until, until I received the data about the upcoming vaccination point, I wasn't sure. Yeah. But, I mean, if, if, I mean I'm speculating, obviously, I'm extrapolating from the data that I mean, to me, it's a good sign that, that those slots haven't filled up yet. So I, I would say we're we're getting pretty close. I, mean, I think our next step would be to uh, do some data data collection and see where we're at with those. Two. I'm really curious now. Okay? As you can tell, I was I was surprised that clinic didn't fill up in an hour. So it was a nice surprise. So the the state municipal data has got our five to eleven year olds. Which kind of encompasses that school at seventy one percent, with another nineteen percent partially vaccinated. So it's very likely that that would that that would fill. So we, we should be at like ninety one percent roughly in a couple of weeks. And I just wanted to kind of get that on everyone's agenda or top of mind that um, shouldn't if it makes sense, we would be likely looking for a waiver for that school as well. No, it's a matter of as, as, and, and I suppose Shaker Lane. Sorry, because they would that's five to eleven Shaker Lane as well. I mean, we, we still need to be monitoring the data as it comes in. I mean, the trending is, is going down as we anticipated, but uh, I want to make sure first of all that we're we, we stick to a process, and make sure we're using sufficient data to make decisions, and uh, secondly, I, I want to make sure that that what we uh, embark upon is doable. And we have limited resources. We want to make sure that we do a good job of everything we do. So, uh, there, there will it come a time when, when Russell Street and, and Chicago and be included, and maybe consider them later. But we need we, we can't throw data away. I, mean, I know you, you know that, but I think I need to say that. Uh, just because we're on a slide doesn't mean we're going to be on a slide forever. And I think that, that uh, attention to detail and attention to data has, has been a, a huge determination in, in our success. So, I just want to. 
really, really be not elderly cautious, but be cautious here. I mean, uh, it's not time to, to party. We're not there yet, but we're getting closer. And we're not at the end of the tunnel. We're getting closer to the light at the end of the tunnel. Right? But I agree with all of those things. But I would also say that certification of an 80%, exceeding 80% threshold doesn't obligate us to do any kind of policy decision. It just allows us to have a conversation. And so, um, as someone who's not sure I would vote on any kind of thing in the schools right now, I would still want us to have the opportunity of the school committee to consider the options in front of us. So, as Justin, I think, was suggesting, if in three or four weeks it seems likely that we've reached that 80%, um, I would want us to know that and then probably to seek to certification just to open open the conversation because we can't have it if we have that as a certification. Sure. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. Can agree with. And it's also important, Doug. We 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 control so much data, mm -hmm. but currently there are 33 schools that have uh, attestation waivers. We have 2,100 schools, one percent. Mm -hmm. So again, it's it's my job to make sure that we, we have the necessary context that we need. And if you're not careful, you, you would think that everybody's doing this, but they're not. And, and I'm not saying that should be a caution, but it should be an awareness that. Every school district out there is, a, is a jumping at, at the opportunity that attestation is submitted. And I think we're, our timing is, has been spot on at this point in time. Any other thoughts before we move on to the next agenda? Just kind of. Yeah, I think we mm -hmm. probably are all going to have a, a lot to say on the, t on the tail of what you just said, but in terms of. Brad's point, it's, it's simply the paperwork. You know, when, when we can get the attestation form, I think we'd like you to get the attestation form. Yeah, right. yeah. I think that's, so we'll, we'll be working on that in the next couple of weeks. Uh, then move us to the next agenda item one under new business, continue discussion of conditions for mass flexibility at LHS. Um, I know that there was a board of health meeting last night. Uh, I was not able to watch myself. I know Brad, you just want to give me updates. Uh, you guys, yeah, uh, yeah. So if any of you guys want to jump in, just kind of talk a little bit about what was said last night, and we can kind of jump into where we're at. I mean, in summary, there was some appetite from the Board of Health to um, discuss voting on, you know, giving at least the high school, if not high school and middle school, uh, a waiver from the town mass mandate. But the decision was made based on procedural concerns to delay that vote um, based on a technicality, essentially, that there is not an active request on the table from the school committee. That request was basically expired after it was enough declined, um, you know, a couple meetings ago. So, uh, so let's do it. Yeah. We yeah. <laughs> so we're going to rectify that, I hope. Um, but there is a meeting, I believe, on the books this Monday. It they posted for Monday. They posted for Monday. Uh, emergency meeting off, you know, off the regular schedule to to vote on this topic. So you know, tonight, I think we need to make a decision about what that request actually looks like. When we yeah, when we have the request finalized, I'll certainly send them a letter tomorrow to make sure we're agenda for them. We uh, cannot post a meeting for a, a joint meeting. So we don't have a window, but Matt and I will certainly be there and represent the school committee and, and represent the decision. For so do you have a 48-hour window till Monday? No, it's Yeah, um, I feel like we're playing a game of whack-a-mole where we make a motion and then something else pops up and we're, we're trying to get, I mean, I, I do think maybe the best course of action here is probably a joint meeting with the Board of Health. Just my, my concern is we make a motion, it goes to the Board of Health, they amend the motion that that's going to come. I mean, then it's May, like, you know, so my, my preferred strategy would be let, let's get a motion on the table and let part of that motion should be joint meeting. I understand technically we can't post a joint meeting, but maybe all of us could go. It's their meeting anyways. We'd have to reach out to see if they were available on Tuesday. Um, yeah, yeah I mean, well, CTEs. So, so I just wanted to I just wanted to throw that out there that you know we can certainly try to make a motion tonight and see what happens on Monday, 
And if Monday doesn't work, I think the logical next step would be to stop having separate meetings and just have a joint meeting and try to take care of business. Request a joint meeting. Yeah. So what I mean, that's that's my I guess that's an idea on the floor. Yeah, I would agree. I think uh, ideally I would have loved to have a joint meeting on Monday, but that's not feasible. But I think that we can uh, make a motion to, to figure out the wording for a motion to move forward getting the waiver and we have to make a separate motion to this have a joint meeting we could do that as well so uh, i'll open it up to any board members who have any thoughts on the matter of how we want to word our motion justin sure um so a lot an awful lot has changed in the past couple of weeks from essentially you know, we're moving forward without test and stay, contact tracing is essentially no more. Um, I, I recognize the fact that cases are still happening, Kelly, but we're, we're 85% vaccinated as a town, 63% boosted. Our K-12 population, especially at the vaccination rate, are the safest individuals on the planet. Um, if you want an additional layer of safety, you can wear a properly fitted KN95 mask. Um, I think that the waiver that we need to ask for is an unconditional K to 12 or pre K to 12 waiver and just allow the Board of Health should allow the school committee to make our decisions as it relates to masking um, the school population because, in reality, we're the experts, we're the ones digesting. The deaths, the information, the changes that are taking place, it's its a little bit too much to ask the Board of Health to, to do that as well. Um, you know, they were not aware that, or I believe that they were not aware that DESI had changed the language and now allows for unvaccinated individuals to unmask once you're over the threshold. And that's, that's a big deal. Um, it's, it's about treating students equitably, not based upon the decisions that they made. If, if vaccine is a choice, masking should be a personal choice as well. The vaccine works wonders. As we just saw, the cloth masks and the surgical masks don't do much at all of anything. Um, so to start the conversation, I'm at an unconditional waiver, pre-K through 12. Right. I would just point out that we can't ask for the at least the pre-K through through six because we don't have an accessation for it. Sure. Doesn't matter. But I don't mean no, I don't mean to cut you off, but when we get it, we don't have to go to them. It's just we're going to handle our house. They can do the town. We'll do okay, the what you're saying. Okay. So you're saying that when when certified, mm -hmm. when Desi allows us to do this, you're asking that we be permitted. Correct. Okay. So that would have to be contained in the motion. I think that right. the more specificity you have when you come up with a motion tonight, I think the better off will be Monday. I respectfully disagree because we've had we've had issues with putting so much language in the motion that we had dates in there and expired and they took it away from us. It's just plain and simple. It's just, you know, the, the Board of Health offers a mask waiver for Littleton Public Schools, period. But um, they are, I mean, not catch up, but they are legally not allowed to give the waiver that Desi prohibits us from having. So I, I don't want to get into that discussion. So we, right, we, we can't take the masks up the Shaker Lane or Russell Street kids anyways. We can't do that because Desi's got a mask mandate. Right. right, so we shouldn't ask for permission to do that. Yes. They can't give it. No, I, I, I have to say I agree with Justin only because we're trying, what I think what you're saying is you're trying to skip that middleman and then go back and forth over weeks and weeks. Once we hit the threshold at Russell Street and Shaker Lane, we can automatically, we don't have to go back to the to Board of Health. We can automatically say, okay, we got the attestation form from DESI, and now we can implement mass flexibility. Yeah, you we don't have to worry about yeah. going back to the Board of Health at that time and then have them wait for their meeting to go and they make the motion and we have to go back to our meeting. I think that's what yeah, you're I, saying. I, exactly. Is just that's what Brad and I are saying. It. Yeah. It's like we're all just saying the same thing. thing. Yeah. Well, I agree with you know, 
the idea in, in principle, and I'd love to kind of know, man. My thought process on it is what will the Board of Health, will they, are they more likely to approve that waiver or are they more likely to approve a waiver that we specifically say middle school and high school now that we have the attestation? So I don't want to go back and forth with them because they didn't like something that we put in that because it was too general. Well, I think that might be why we should have a meeting with them. I, I agree, that's what I'm saying, but my point is, I, I, like I said, I feel as soon as we can get everyone unmasked, the better. Um, it's just a question of the process of what's going to work, what's going to get, what's going to allow us to do this. Uh, Matt, why would they be hesitant if we phrased it as we're requesting a waiver for all the schools as soon as each school meets the contingency level, that threshold level of 80%. Right. Um, I'm not sure what the hesitation. Yeah, like let's let's pretend thing. for a second that we don't have a town townwide mask mandate. Right. If we wanted to, we could at this point allow the high school and middle school. That would be our decision. We couldn't do that right now for Shaker Lane or Russell Street right. because we don't have the form. So maybe we are all saying the same thing. We are, just but I'm, I'm just suggesting, suggesting that we we don't differentiate the schools. We don't put a timeline on it. We just say, hey, look. We're, we're asking to be exempt from your townwide mask mandate. We will follow DESE's guidance, of course, because that's our authoritative power. Like, that's who governs us. Like, that's who's made, who supersedes us. So I think we all agree in principle on what we want to have as a matter of strategy. Right. And, you know, what's going to get us to that point? Well, can, can we talk about that? Because yeah. when, we, when we last debated this and talked about this, our argument for asking the Board of Health for exemption was we have all these players in mitigation in place. You should treat us differently than you do other places in town. But your motion takes away those those mitigation tracks, right? So you're asking. There's no pool testing that needs to be required. There's no parental consent. We're including everybody. There's um, there's no threshold of these are too many cases or not. And these are all things that we discussed and and with the board health and among ourselves and within the community. As saying we're important. One of the reasons I, I like the plan we had in place um, was that it, it we kind of reality tested it. And so at the high school, we said if you have you know cases above a certain level, we keep the mask on. Um, and that would have worked for two, like we had 28 cases two weeks ago, 20 cases last week, four cases this week, which meant if that plan were in place right now, if the board health had not um because the authorities understood taking away because of dates, then that meant we would be in place if we had only a one-week threshold to put that mass flexibility plan in place forward. Mm -hmm. You're saying things have changed in the last two weeks. They um, have. They have. Some have. But, um, but I'm not sure what has changed that meant we have to get rid of the four mitigation strategies we had in place in our plan that we liked, all like two weeks ago. So in my opinion, what's changed is that all of those cases happen mm -hmm. with the masks on mm -hmm. and all of these mitigation strategies in place. A mask, a waiver from the Board of Health doesn't mean that 1,500 people are going to show up without masks on. Mm -hmm. It just means that they're not mandated to wear one. So when things are surging, I mean, based upon the vaccination numbers in our town, I think a lot of people are going to make a responsible decision and wear a mask. People are all over the risk spectrum. I mean, and there's a lot of folks that are at one end or the other, like way too far. But if you're vaccinated and or boosted as an adult or available and in good health, kind of the only reason to put a mask on is to make sure that the hospital didn't get out of control. Like I started masking again because I was afraid, not afraid, that's the wrong word, I was concerned for my fellow citizens that we were going to get to over 100% hospitalization. And that's not fair to the individual that has a heart attack or a car accident, the sprains of the ankle or whatever. But now that we're back on the other side of that, I, I, I kind of go back to the thing like if vaccination's a choice, masking should be a choice. Everyone's had an opportunity for a vaccine. The vaccines work terrifically. The masking, as evidenced by what just happened, doesn't work all that well, if at all. And 
it goes back to the contact tracing in the direction that Massachusetts is going with the testing. This is an administrative nightmare. Permission slips, pool testing, 11 cases. What if my kid misses pool testing? He's on the thing. Do I need to have a wristband? Enough's enough. A eradicated wristband, by the way. I just I, I I threw that in just for dramatic effect. <laughs> But I think that's, I, I, I will agree with that too. The administrative nightmare, the, the number of hoops, the level of involvement that the Board of Health and, and like detail is getting into about you know, how to enforce this administratively. It just, I mean, when Desi put in place these mask waivers, they didn't provide a laundry list of contingencies or optional contingencies. They said, this is how you can do it. If your school has reached 80%. Masks optional, and then they amended it to say vaccinated or unvaccinated to, to maintain equity. So we have followed Desi guidelines to the team for close to two years now. I mean, why not now? This is what Desi is offering, recommending. Why not follow it? Yeah, I personally, I am right there with you as far as what mitigation strategies. I don't feel we need those. I think I'm willing to. Do to try it your way. My question is just, you talk about different ends of the spectrum, people with comfortability, and I'm thinking of, you know, I'm thinking about the people who I have on the Board of Health, what their reaction is going to be, where they are in that spectrum of risk. Um, so, just being in the meetings with them, talking with them, uh, I just wanted to move forward with our best opportunity. I'm willing to give this a try because I agree with you. I agree with you. Uh, that there really shouldn't be any stipulations. Um, but it's just, we have to, as a board, have to decide is this the best way to go forward. So um, so it's like we're making a decision based on what you're saying that based on what we think will be approved versus what we really believe is the right course of action. Right, that's good. And that's, just, that's tricky. It's that like that's tricky. really yeah. compromising our, what we feel so, is right. Yeah. So, but, oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like so, 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 I just want to like burn your mind. Sorry. Jump in, Stella. So I actually share similar opinions to my dad, although my experience is coming from a student in the school who has like a health condition, but also like experiences masking, experiences pool testing, comes from someone actually experiencing all of this, like on the other side of this. And I just, if we follow through with going mask optional under the condition that those who can be unmasked don't have to be vaccinated, don't have to participate in cool testing, I and my peers, my friends, people I've talked to, people that have um, health conditions, just, I don't think I feel as safe at school. I trust Slim Snow, I trust the principals, I trust the nurses, I trust that they're doing all that they can. But I just can't imagine that we're moving masks without regulating the mitigations that we can, like vaccination status and pool testing, would make the school as safe as it ultimately can be. And also, um, so I forget exactly the quarantine guidelines that were if you contract COVID, but even so, we'd be missing school. And I understand that taking off the masks is a big push for that is mental health. But I would like to kind of counter that by saying that removing masks will ultimately lead to the transition of COVID. Masks, as we know, as Katrina said, keep the COVID, keep us from prevent from transmitting it as much as we can. But if we like, I forget exactly how I phrased it in my head, but getting COVID forces you to have to stay home and isolate. I would argue that that's more detrimental to the mental health of students than not being able to see each other's masks come out in house. And that's my experience as a student and as someone who is going through this, just that I think we should, if we were to go mask optional, mask flexible, we should still continue to have the pool testing and that we still should continue to require some sort of vaccination status, even though that's a new way to I appreciate you saying that. So I have uh, just a couple of things. Uh, if we we take the approach, and, and, and I'm certainly in agreement that we, we don't differentiate between vaccinated and unvaccinated, but 
in, in essence, and we need to probe this a little more. What what I'm hearing from you, and maybe I'm hearing it correctly, is that it, it, it doesn't matter what our participation rate is in pool testing or the or the weekly uh, take home rapid tests. So, am I to assume that 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 makes no difference as well? Because I think it does make a difference. And, and, that's just one point I want to make, and I think we need to have a discussion about that because we are successful because of what we've done. And I'm not saying things haven't changed. You heard me say that many times, but I don't know whether I'm, I'm drinking the Kool Aid to the end of the continuum where some of you are at, and maybe I'm misreading. The other one, and I just want to approach uh, the, the question, uh, the, the comment that Jen made. I don't believe we're making a motion that contains information that, that is going to help the, the Board of Health make a decision. I, I look at this as, I'm gonna look at all of you as, as, as elected officials. And I've said this many times, I rely on all of you to help us determine the policy of the community. Well, the question I'm gonna to pose to you, do you really feel at this point in time, and I don't know the answer, that most of our community is ready to, to throw some caution to the wind to make this happen? If I'm not convinced myself, but I may not have all the information, I would I would venture to guess. I don't want to throw percentages out there with because I don't have any validity, but I would say there would be a significant population of families in Middleton that that still want us to to be process oriented and be cautious with, with the end result of getting rid of, of mitigation strategies when the data warrants them. So I, I'd like to hear more from you with those, with those two, two components. Can I, can I make one comment? Yeah. Just um, thinking about the mental health of our students and our staff, uh, I think we just need to make sure that we're keeping that in mind. Testing helps, masks help. There are many students who are frustrated with having to wear masks. There are many students who have a lot of anxiety around keeping masks off. Um, their staff as well. So I just think that that's an important factor to consider and we don't have the data on that yet. And, and it, it is a real concern of, of mine about students who might be afraid to come to school because they're afraid they're gonna get COVID. That's real. Whether the likelihood of the data shows us that it's, it's very, there's a very rare chance that they will get COVID or get very sick if they get COVID. But as we know about anxiety, there can be irrational fears. And, and that is real to many students, and I just think it's something to keep in mind. Right. I think the question is whether, as Justin puts it, having a blanket waiver to cover everything to say there's no stipulations and then let the school committee decide whether there's, we want to put those stipulations and whether we want to continue full testing, whether we want to make it just for vaccinated. I think that's more the question that we're dealing with here. We're not saying that we were, we're talking really about the motion. And how would to phrase that? Um, and if this were, if we do a blanket, the and Board of Health says unconditional waiver for unmasking in public in those public schools, it's up to the school committee, and the school committee can determine what type of mitigation strategies they want to put in place to unmask. Um, is that correct? That's correct. I mean, as I said. You know, I do feel like we are more knowledgeable as it relates to the K-12 and the DESE situation and the ever-changing rules than the Board of Health. I mean, they have their own stuff going on. And then to ask them to sort of monitor what's happening with us, it's just, quite honestly, we can do a better job of it. Um, Stella, thank you for speaking up. I know you made your dad real proud. I mean, um, that must not have been easy to do. And I want to thank you for sharing that. Um, when I understand that people aren't ready to take their masks off and by not having a mask mandate, that doesn't change anything for them. Um, you can, you know, most of the kids are, most of the kids are vaccinated. Those that want to wear a mask should be wearing an N95 mask. You have, you, you, you can't get much better protection, if any, from putting those, those mitigation strategies together as you watch me continue to pull my mask up, I mean, universal masking of everyone is, is, is 2020. It's the 2020 playbook. 
now that vaccination is out there, it's widely publicized at this point in time by medical professionals and, and industry experts that you don't need universal masking at this point in time. And I fear, or I'm, I'm, I'm sad to hear that maybe some of this anxiety among folks has been created by the media, the school committee meetings, the board of health meetings. It's going to take some time for people to heal. And I don't want the healing to start next year. I want it to start now. And when you're ready, take your mask off. I, I feel like a hypocrite. I'd like to have my mask off. The only reason I have my mask on is because the board of health requires me to have it on and I would invite all of you to take yours off. I mean, I'm completely comfortable with that at this point in time. Um, and I know many of, many of you guys are as well. So it's a very difficult subject. It's time to move on. In my opinion, that doesn't mean everyone's going to move on. It just means that when you're ready, we will accept you with a mask or without a mask, with a vaccination or without a vaccination. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to add to that. Um, something I've heard parents say, this is anecdotally, but in our town, um, that they've been talking to their children about trying to let their children understand that getting COVID, especially during this last surge where so many people are getting it, that getting COVID is not a moral failure. And it's so sad to me that we're at a point where children think that getting sick is a moral failure. How has this happened? How have we, as a, as a society, gotten to the point where kids feel bad, guilty? I mean, imagine feeling guilty that you caught a cold when you were a kid, you know? I mean, this is a cold, it's not a cold, it's a virus, people get it. Um, and that goes to, you know, both what Stella and what you were saying, kids are afraid to take off their masks. It's, first of all, as Justin said, Absolutely keep your mask on if that makes you comfortable. I think we will have a good, healthy mix of N95 masks and mask optional. I think if a kid maybe it might be day to day. Um, but we have to start getting back to normal. And you know, the surge is ending, and there will be more surges, there will be more variants. But we're almost two years in. We have to start transitioning back to normal. And if that includes maybe coming up as a school committee with a plan to help ease that transition mentally for kids you know hey, maybe it's signage maybe it's conversations with teachers it's groups gatherings i don't know but you know acknowledging that like we're moving into a new era this is good uh everybody can take it at their own speed it's personal choice and it's personal responsibility i think those are really good lessons for kids to learn um but i think things have to change and i feel that now is the time and it's important to remember that our our students and, and our families, for the most part, aren't masking outdoors. So it's not as if we have masks on 24-7. And I agree with, me, with, with what you're saying, Jen. It needs to, we need to change the stigma that exists in the situation. I think a couple of things, and I'm just thinking out loud. I'm having difficulty, a bit of difficulty, separating a general motion without an understanding of what that means or not to in terms of conditions. Uh, I think something else that, that certainly has a lot of merit is we need to make sure that we keep our immunocompromised staff and students at the forefront of our discussions. And we haven't to a certain degree, especially when we're, we're entertaining a, a, a change of this magnitude. And I think our families, uh, I don't think, I know our families need, need some assurance that people that, that are immunocompromised and, and are undergoing therapy, et cetera, are going to have the necessary safety protections so that they feel comfortable with their students. Uh, the last thing I want to do is, is start softening our mitigation strategies and having students leave our school system as a result of, of them feeling not safe. I mean, that would be counterproductive to, to what we're trying to do as a group. But I think that, that needs to be at least acknowledged that, that we need to be concerned about this and we move forward. I do think it's time to move forward. I just want to make sure that, that we've covered all the angles so that, that we know we've, we've not only been true to ourselves, but true to the community of Littleton, that, that we're thinking about everything we can prior to, prior to moving forward. And it is time to, to entertain some sort of change. I agree 100%. I'm just not sure how far we go down that continuum. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
to a point. So, Kelly, of, of, of course, of course, that's the case. I mean, we were doing that before COVID. You know, there, there were immunocompromised students and staff in our population before COVID, after COVID. I fully expect the administration, if you need the school committee's help, of course, but we will do what's, what's right and what's best for those that need an individualized situation. Um, I mean, I don't know, need to tell the anecdotal stories, but I mean, when Hopkinton first did this, I recognized they put the mask back on during the surge, but I mean, they did have some staff that wore masks and they noticed that the kids wore masks in that classroom when the, when the teacher did, it was out of a respect thing. I mean, again, the end of a mandate just means that you don't have to do it. Um, a lot of kids, a lot of staff are still going to wear masks. They're wearing a mask and they're serious about it. They're having a 95 on. We're not, you know, we're not being reckless. Look, I mean, if you look at the vaccination numbers in town, we're not a reckless group. Oh, no. If you go across the street to Tavern in the Square, you'll find 100 people over there without masks on, you know, socializing. And they're the vaccinated people. They're not, they're not the reckless group. So everyone's got their own you know, perception of reality. You know, you work in the schools, you guys have been masked for two years. I don't, I work in the private sector. I, for the, you know, I haven't really had a mask on. Um, I've been, you know, going out to lunch, business meetings, unmasking, like we're at opposite ends of the spectrum. And that's just because of the world we've been living in. And I want to let you know that, you know, this is not a reckless opinion. This is the opinion of many residents in town. I get, a, I get a lot of emails, a lot of Facebook messages about where I'm coming from. A lot. Right. A couple of thoughts. One is we did do a survey and I know not everyone was impressed with survey, but we had more than a thousand responses. And the, the lens point is there were, if I recall correctly, I don't know the top of my head, um, a majority um, favored doing something like this. Um, 15, 20% by call correctly, ambivalent, not really sure, and then a, a minority, but a sizable minority. Um, Fair yeah. Yeah, about 30%. So, um, so I think it, it's appropriate that the school committee seems to reflect some of the divisions that are in the town. Um, that's fine. We don't have to be names on things. Um, I'm not inclined to support no restrictions, nothing, take away all the mitigation strategies. I like the plan we had. We were at least mandating the pool testing um, and trying to make sure we have a clearer view of what's happening in schools as possible, especially if fewer than 1% of schools in the state are doing this. It's it's still experimental, even if we can point to this town, this town, this town. Um, having a as clear a view of what's happening at least as a, a condition of doing this would make me feel much, much, much more comfortable. Um, I would say, though, that if we do move forward in this way, I hope there are a couple of things that we can clarify among ourselves, even if it's not part of the motion. One is I'd like our schools to provide N95 masks to the students, um, just have them out. If, if people are going mask, let's make sure they're using the good ones. Um, and so they're staying up, you're not falling down. Um, so those students um, and staff can feel comfortable. One thing, um, speaking not against interest, but I think one thing that's really compelling to me is the, the study that I'm reading that says uh, a properly fitted N95 mask is the we're no longer in the your mask protects, protects you, protects me, my mask protects you, is we're in the you wear a good mask, you're you're getting the protection of masking. I don't think masking is coded theater. I think poorly masking maybe is coded theater. And I acknowledge that maybe that's part of what's going on in schools. I've seen it in some of the high schools where I teach. Um, so I, I recognize that. So if we're gonna if we're gonna move down this path, let's make sure everyone who wants a mask has these masks, right? And I hope that's something we as a school district could provide. I also want to think a little bit about, and we'll get the details wrong, is the we are low COVID cases, statistically, we probably have more COVID cases, or at least than we would without all these mitigation strategies in place. Um, maybe marginally, but I, I think it's probably true. We need to think about what the reentry plan is. Um, if there is some discrepancy after five days, you can come back, even if you've got the, the line, or, or we, if they come back on day six. Are they, according to those guidelines, those new guidelines, which I, I didn't memorize, I'm sorry, are they, you have to are they do you have to be, are we, man, are we, are we mandating the mask for those days six through 10? Or are we saying, I don't think 
Um, we're, you know, we're, we're not following that guideline. Well, we're going to follow Desi. I believe we should follow Desi. Yeah, I'm not, that's my point. I'm not suggesting that we make up um, any rules beyond what they've already, like, I'm not lessening anything than what the state has mandated. We, we don't have those updated protocols yet. Okay. For, for, for I, I, know, I know if a win said there are going to be some more coming. I, just, I mean, that's I mean, the way the CDC, talking. that's like that's CDC guideline. So no, we're, when we're looking at isolation, we're <coughs> looking at EPH testing guidelines mm -hmm. in terms of that's what we do for the law. So there's, there's no, I just, I don't mean to, there's no test to come back. So right. like, right. yeah, you test positive, you're up for five days. Exactly. It's recommended that you test again. But you you can come back and you come back with a mask for five more days. No, no fever for twenty. That's the way it works. So there'll already be people wearing masks anyways. People will want to leave them on. So if you come back from testing positive, you have to wear a mask until you finish your. Okay. Yeah, you, that's the way it works. Okay, that I just yeah. We we, just, we seem to maybe we've been making assumptions in the past. I assume that based on our previous votes that we would keep some information in place. Um, I want to be clear then. So these are at some point there will be circumstances where people are required to mask. Um, in this in this situation, days six through ten. If sorry, okay, just yes. All right. So Brad, just to probe a little more, what what are you what are you suggesting there? And I'm gonna I'm gonna hit twelve testing and and, and also have home there tests. Do you, do you feel, or as a group, maybe it's a group question, do you feel that, that those mitigation strategies are, are pertinent to setting us up for success as we move forward with, with mass flexibility for, for all students? First thing is, I want mass flexibility for all students. I want it. I, um, I'm maybe not as comfortable with everybody else is moving all the strategies all at once when we have 290 cases in town and when we had. 17 cases at the middle school so far this week. Um, and 18 last week and 28 at the high school week before that. It's just, they've been a little cautious than usual. But if you're asking what, as I think through this, and I'm thinking through this, I'm not committed. I, I would like to have some sort of cool testing, not requirement, then a threshold. Um, so we have an accurate sense of what's happening in our schools. Um, I would like to have the availability of K95 masks for everybody who wants them. Um, I would like, if we can't require the, look, if we can, if they're getting tested twice a week and they're actually doing it, I feel a lot more comfortable about that. I, I just do. Um, I, I love that new program. Um, I can get my head around this. Um, I, I was comfortable with the idea of, of a test. Let's try it out for the high school model where we have these safeguards in place just to make sure it's really working. Um, I was comfortable with that. Um, I'm less comfortable with this. I can be persuaded, I suppose, or I can just admit I might be wrong. That's fine. I'm, I'm, I'm wrong all the time. Brad, what about um, when we talked about that yeah. that that potential condition or yeah. mitigation layer? We talked about enrollment in pool yeah. testing versus you know certified participation yeah. on a weekly basis. And I understand there's a quite a delta between the two. Sure. A lot of kids aren't going; they mean to go, mm -hmm. but they have no time. Then let's poke into that a little bit. Or would you want to require a, some sort of a validation of you know that Monday that kid was tested so they can keep the I mean, it's optional or it's just an it's enrollment question? It's not just what I want, it's what we've all wanted sure. by five months or both. Yeah, month ago. Um, I, yeah, I like I would like to know that the students are being tested at least once, maybe twice a week. Um, whether we can require it, whether it's too administrative, whether it's too much of a hassle, look. We can disagree. Um, I would feel better communicating to the town that we're not being that we're we're acknowledging that some people have concerns about the, the rapidity of the change, and um, I think it's it, I, and that I, that would make me feel better to know that we're getting a close look at what's happening in our schools, especially during and what will be an experimental period when cases are in, in the town are still high. Um, I would feel more comfortable with that, but I. I mean, that's one voice. Right. And then I think I agree with you, Brad, on keeping some mitigation strategies. I think what I'm saying is I don't like the Board of Health dictating what those are, giving us a list of mm -hmm. the 10 things that have to occur before we implement a 
uh, mask optional strategy. Um, if we were given, if we did get a blanket waiver, I would push to have some kind of testing continued as part of the, the plan for it to go forward. That's the so I'm with you on that. So, so there's two different things we're, we're talking about here. Um, one is how do we ask for the waiver? Is it a blanket or are we just aiming for the high school middle school right now? Are we just doing... Um, I, I don't think the high school middle school, like we spent a couple minutes. I think that's just is a subordinate clause, you know, when, when approved by Desi, I think that's, I think we're all looking for a district-wide okay. um, so waiver at some point, it's just how do we word it so that it's clear that we're not going to implement things without Desi approved. I'm, I'm not worried about that. Okay. okay. Like we're all on the same page. Right? I think just, we're all on the same page. Right? It's just um, to what degree do we, as a, a committee, if one, I guess there are two questions. One, do we think as a committee um, that there should be some sort of threshold or benchmarks or for participation in testing or whatever it is that, that are important to us to get a sense of what's really happening in school. We've been reporting out to our community for almost two straight years, very detailed information in our school. If we remove that, we can, our reports will have a little maybe less confidence. I think the data um, is good. I think that, you know, we're not looking, at least I'm not looking to do a three-week trial. I'm looking to implement a mass um, mask optional for the remainder of the year with possibly some mitigation strategies. And then we review how that data, how it goes. And then next year, we'll see where we're at. And may just go, hopefully we're not even, it's not even a conversation, but if, if it is, mask optional. Well, can I ask one other question then? Because one of the things we had in our previous plan, that was this whole thing for you, was the idea that there were some, some backstops. So we, we set a number of thresholds. We did this part because the board of health communicated they wanted that part because we just made seem to think it would have been. Now, we've, we've been past those thresholds in almost every school for the last three years. Maybe things have changed because of contact tracing. Can you re remind each other why we chose those numbers? Was it staff capacity or was it, um, was it something else? Justin, you remember better than I did? Or? I mean, Kelly probably add on to yeah. this, but I think. We settled on a number roughly around 2%, which was a, a more than 10, so 11 or more cases. But, um, you know, so, so Cohasset High School is mask optional, okay? And they were December 6th. Does that date sound familiar to anybody? Mm -hmm. um, and then the middle school went mask optional the day after Martin Luther King Day, which is another date that sounds familiar. Mm -hmm. um, and what, when they looked at the data, so they had one set of students that have like roughly the same social patterns. I mean, high school is a little bit yeah. rough. Anyway, you know what I'm going. The COVID cases between the masked and the unmasked were roughly the same. Okay, so, you know, do we need to have a backstop of a mandate where we're going to mandate that you put a mask on? I don't think so. I think we've got enough responsible citizens in town that if the numbers get really, really high, People are going to protect themselves from putting on an N95 mask in addition to their vaccine. I don't think we ever have to get into a situation unless a variant comes out that's very lethal. Mm -hmm. And we say, you know what? Even though you're not willing to protect yourself, we're going to require you to protect yourself because things have changed. But with what's, what's going on now in the vaccine and the Omicron, and I mean, I'm just not comfortable anymore with requiring mandating that people wear a mask. If we're going to mandate something, mandate the vaccine. That's what works. Yeah, I also think to your to answer the question also from my perspective, I think when we thought about those numbers, the numbers we've seen over the past few weeks were like unimaginable. Like we, I think to some extent, those numbers just seemed sort of, sort of so astronomical that it was like, if this gets crazy out of hand, okay, we'll put in a bad stuff. We've seen it happen. We've gotten through it. Yeah, there have been flips in the road. There have been, I know, I don't mean to minimize, the, you know, the teachers have been doing an incredible job. Teachers have been out. Kids have been out. The fact that, um, and also to your point, Stella, um, the CDC requirement for quarantining um, has gone down to five days. So if you are diagnosed with COVID on a Wednesday morning, you're going to miss three days of school at most, right? Mm -hmm. So that's a huge change. That's a, you know, halving of the loss of learning time, both for kids and for teachers, assuming they're asymptomatic on day six. 
So I think that's a big change. Um, I think that's why I'm more comfortable not um, worrying too much about case explosions. We've seen the cases skyrocket, and we've seen kids get sick, and we've seen kids get better. And, and the other thing I'll add, and Brad, I, I mean, I, full testing sounds like a great idea. I mean, if you're negative, what's a mask do among a bunch of bunch of negative people? Nothing. You don't need them. Um, but that's just a snapshot in time. So if full testing's on Monday, I submit my sample on Monday. I could become positive and contagious Tuesday. And what did that full testing do? Nothing, because I was negative the day that I submitted my sample. So, like. It's the situation is fluid. I mean, the pool, like, the pool testing is not about individual safety, it's about community safety, right? So, pool testing, that's what I mean. Yeah. So, that person gets bounced from the population, but it's just a snapshot in time. So, like, they have their mask off, you know, you tested negative. A couple of days later, they test positive. Like, it doesn't, it doesn't really help as much as I think you think it helps. But that's the power of the, the take home antigen test. We're getting a, a, a second kick at the can. Correct. And those yeah. folks can use those. And there might be some folks that don't want to test at school and they'll test at home. And the counter argument was, well, how can we test them? To, how can we make, how can we trust them to be testing at home? Well, we're just going to have to trust them. If they're taking the test, they should be using them. And back to the, the threshold number, Brad, when, when we developed that number, we were we were dealing with Delta, mm-hmm. with which had far more serious serious uh, side effects or, or or certain conditions that, that existed as a result of the infection. Uh, and again, I, I don't want to sound like just because we we have a, a new variant, an Omicron variant that, that has uh, less severe effects when, when you're infected, that we throw all caution to the wind, but. I'm, I'm, I'm on the fence, to be honest with you, in, in terms of whether we do need that benchmark you now. If, if, a, if a, a variant comes along that, that mirrors uh, Delta, then I would certainly jump to the side of the fence where we need some type of benchmark. Listen, that's why I'd say Jen's argument is compelling. If, if the 10 was our estimate of what is our threshold of what our system could, could handle, and we kept going with 28 cases, with struggle, we kept going with 20 cases, then maybe the 10 as the threshold. I mean, I'll accept that argument, but maybe that meant that our threshold of our system can handle wasn't as high as it should be. Um, I'm just pointing out that, you know, just what you're saying, school testing doesn't work on Tuesday, if you have, but it does help on Monday if you if, if you catch those. And my guess, my understanding is we've caught a lot of cases through school testing. Um, my also understanding is that part of what we're doing is reporting to the community that their schools are safe and having the pool testing, having I want some sort of, I would like, I don't want, I'm not demanding, I would like some sort of certainty that we will continue to have or will increase the percentage of students participating in pool testing. Um, because I think that can give our students greater confidence that um, their environment is as safe as statistics show um, and that we're moving people who are, um, um, who are sick but asymptomatic. And also give our community um, some sense that we're, we're acting in good faith and we'll keep reporting the same data and we'll get all the same information we had before. We're not trying to find cases or anything. But maybe it's just that we, we can't agree on that mm-hmm. now. And yes. I, I, I accept that. Well, no. I agree with you on, on that. I just wanted to get back for a second to what we were talking about as far as a stop, a number, a threshold. I don't, I don't think we need a threshold number, but I am not opposed to, I trust the administration. I think that. If a new variant comes in, where you know, if we have to mask up for a small period, I trust the administration to make that decision and say we're masking up for the next couple of weeks. And so I think that in that in those scenarios, you can tell these are our schools. We want to keep them safe, and we can tell people coming there that you were required to wear a mask. But I don't think we need to come to a, a, a number. I trust you know we read the news, we know what's going on, Delta and. All in front of two very different variants. We, we can't plan for what's going to come down the road, but we can trust our administration to make a, a conscientious decision if we need to do that. That's just my opinion. I said that. Right. I, would, I would just caution a little bit about the idea of 
requiring folks to put masks back on because you are essentially saying that, you know, it could be unsafe for you to go to school if everyone doesn't have a mask on. Like, and that's not the case. The case is get vaccinated, wear an N95, you're as safe as you can be, you don't need universal masking. So I know that in theory it sounds good, but it also sort of furthers that message of, you know, are we really sure we want to be doing this? Um, well, the, the putting on of a, of a mask is, is to counterbalance the infection rates in the school. I mean, please remember that we're not the spread of COVID-19. What happens in the community is, is directly correlated to what happens in the school. We deal with what, what comes into our school. Our transmission rates have been minimal in, in, in our school since COVID started. So, I mean, you really have to, and I know you understand this, but I think it's worth it saying it again, is as, as infection rates increase in the community, it has an impact on our schools. And there comes a point in time in order for us to keep our schools open, we have to try to minimize the infection rate. So we implement mitigation strategies to counterbalance that so that we do not mirror the infection rate of the community. I would also just like to say that like Justin, as you were saying, say a new variant comes along and we, have to, and we say that we have to put the mask back on. That doesn't necessarily indicate that the schools aren't safe. If anything, it indicates that we care about the safety. And I think that's like a, like a good distinction. Like masking doesn't indicate that something's not safe. It just shows that we are prepared and ready to take, to take the precautions that we need to ensure that that's safe. It's not an indication that it's unsafe. It's an indication of like our empathy and how we care. For and sorry. I just would like to say that. Sure. Um, so, I, you know, at this point in time, I think we've talked a lot. Like, I'm prepared to move forward with a motion. I'll also say, and I think this is important for the school committee and for the Board of Health, like, I want the unconditional waiver, but I'll also commit to starting with you need to be in pool testing to take your mask off. Like I will I will compromise there. But I am not I am I reserve the right to change my mind at some point in time after we have implemented this for some period of time. But we can start there. I, feel, that right. I feel the same way. Um I've read made some compelling arguments. I think um I do think pool testing is flawed. I, I and many of us maybe experienced the same with our, our kids in pool testing. There have been personal cases I'm aware of where it just didn't work, um, especially with Omicron, where you know the testing positive seems to happen later in the you know, well after the infection period. So I'm not quite sure pool testing is working as well as we might hope, but I understand it does work sometimes, and I also understand that some of it, and I don't mean this in any disparaging way, but some of it is a psychological thing. It's a, it's a safety net for people to feel like there's something and don't want people to feel like we're pushing them off of, you know, a roof of a skyscraper with no net here. We want to provide some feeling of, of you know, some layer layers, right? Where people are nervous to take the mask off the table, at least there's pool testing. I, and I, I think also, we have a better chance of getting the waiver. Yeah. Yeah, right. Having exactly. committed to that strategy to start. Yeah, and I so yes, I would be open to that as well. And what I like about that is that it allows us to, in some ways, have this function as a, a really highly scrutinized trial test without putting the three week period or something on it, right? So it allows us to, to see as closely as we can what's really happening in the schools. Um, and then um, if we see that the results, prove this to be as safe as we all hope and expect it to be, then, um, then I would be much more likely to support I mean, a strong that as, as, a, as, a, as a obligation. I ask two other questions before we move to the vote. Sorry. It's One right. is, can, can we actually guarantee that we will be able to provide N95 masks to people we want them? Do we have that capacity? As long as uh, supplies last, yeah. Okay. And the other question is, is if you think about mitigation strategies that we were saying that our schools have that maybe the general board doesn't have, that the board is only interested in. We talked a lot about our air filters. 
Um, how, how much time do we spend? I have a builder. <laughs> are we are we replacing those? Are we at the kind of thirteens? Are we are we as fully? Um, are we still doing all that stuff? Yes, we're still yeah. doing all that, okay. and we still have the air purifiers. Okay, that you can see over there. Lights on them when the light goes on. That are in every classroom. <laughs> Okay, I mean, we have those and we have a place to scope them for them as well. And so I know, I'm not making a joke, but if we're saying yeah. that this is as safe an environment as possible yes. to do this, yes. so these are factors that are yes, and we're still stress our mitigation. Yep, and we're still disinfecting the schools and we're still wiping down high touch surfaces. We're still doing all of those mitigation strategies. Okay. Has anything else to say before we reach out the motion on this? Okay, that's just I'll entertain a motion. Um, I move that the school committee, excuse me, the school committee request for an unconditional mask waiver from the townwide mask mandate from the Board of Health. Period. End of motion. Like it's in the minutes that we're going to start with that pool testing strategy. I'll second the motion. Motion made and seconded. Uh, all those in favor. Do you want to ask for discussion because I think Brad's go. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The reason why that pool testing is not in the motion is because if we decide to eliminate pool testing, like if we decide yeah, I, to I get, I get that. Um, I'm back to this more in the clause of the game with all this. But, um, I just think that the bureaucratic part of it is, I don't want to get caught up, and I don't think we will, because I think the spirit of the conversation is clear in the schools that Betsy allows us to, oh, to, to yeah. pursue this then. Yeah. yeah, we have to phrase it perfectly, because as we've seen, if we don't, the Board of Health could potentially reject it based on some I'm try again. loophole. Brad, right. Right. Yeah. I move that the Littleton School Committee request a uh, mask waiver from the Board of Health for the high school and the middle school and potentially the other schools subject to the uh, completion and submission and receival of the DESI waiver, the 80% threshold. I'll second that motion. Okay, motion made and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? Aye, have it. Motion passes. Moving on. We have a school-based wellness update from well, man, I, I don't know if you guys want to do this. Uh, we're trying to be mindful of time. It's yep. nine o'clock. I, I don't want to impose on, on making you stay any longer than you want to. And I don't want to put pressure on our administrators to talk faster than they need to. Yeah, One thing I've noticed uh, the last couple of meetings is they, they feel that they're under pressure to get done in record time. And they, they really talk twice as fast as they usually do to try to try to meet our time requirements. Something's lost when they do that. So I would recommend, that if, unless you want to stay another half hour, uh, to table it to the next meeting. Yeah. On that note, can I just say something? I, I didn't know where to bring it up. I would like to recommend, I mean, over the past 18 months, Katrina's information has been very um, helpful to us. But I think now where we are, in this whole pandemic, I think we should leave Katrina to the Board of Health, maybe send us an update on school-wide things. But I don't think personally, and that I might not be what the board wants, um, I don't think we need Katrina to come every two weeks and update us. We have a COVID dashboard. We get emails every day from Dorothy. So I'm just, and everyone has access to the Board of Health, which happens the night before this. So, and as you can see, our participation in our meetings has gone down. I think more people are watching for Katrina's on the Board of Health. So I don't know where everyone else is at, but uh, then I didn't know where to go. I would agree with that. I think we kind of got, we had kind of started the phase Katrina out and then Delta happened. We wanted more information and Omicron, but I, I don't think it requires a motion. I think we can just kind of say that, you know, we're just I mean, and I, and I spoke with Katrina and I let her know that I was going to make this, you know, to bring this up tonight. Yeah. I feel I, like she's I, very I, I certainly don't feel that we did something that we 
need to include unless things change and we just need an update. Right. Um, I like it. Um, <laughs> I mean, listen, listen, twice? Twice? Huh? Why? You I like don't it? always, sometimes I have like work to do. No, I've got to watch work. Oh, um, <laughs> but no, I think it's important. Okay, there are other options I get. But I also think it's important if we've just made a commitment to ask the board of health uh, to, and we're going to say we're going to think not only about the school, but the community health. It doesn't always have to be, you know, I understand, sides, but, uh, not to interrupt you, I understand that, but I would like to get to the point, I think we were all voted in by the community mm -hmm. to be a school committee, not a board of health. We have been, you and I, since we were voted in, for two years now, all we've done is COVID relief. I would like to get to the point where we are working on our educational gap that we've had in these two years, try to help our administration and our teachers to find out what we can help and what we can do to close that gap for our students. And also the mental health part, the mental health, like Stella said earlier, mental health part is huge. These kids are walking out of, these graduates walked into high school, the kids that are graduating this year, walked into high school and they've had nothing but COVID. And then they're going to go off into a world on their own. And I would like to see if we can implement more things where we can, can reach them and help them in their struggles of anxiety and fits than work with COVID. I agree with all those things. I don't think of making an abbreviated five-minute presentation would prevent us from doing those things. And I do... I find it helpful to think, and we are not, I don't feel as empowered to ask questions during a board health meeting um, as I am during these meetings. Um, now, it doesn't have to be Katrina, but, but I think we do need to thank her oh, for, for, for everything. And so, so, but, I, I but, am very grateful for all the work Katrina has done in the past 18 months. It has been so helpful to us. She does all the research and brings it to us. But I think now we're all educated in this ourselves, where we can, we have been educating ourselves, reading things, doing things. We watch board of health meetings. We, you know, participate. Um, this is just where I'm at. You don't sure, have yeah. to. I, you know, to, no, that's the template we all know about right there. <laughs> um, so, yeah, we don't need public health metrics as new business item number one. Like next meeting. Please, and Kelly, thank you for suggesting that. Like the topic that we're about to pass on is critically important that it should be new business item number one. And I, I personally feel bad that it's nine o'clock and nine oh seven. I'm sure the principals had material prepared, but we're less likely to ask quest good questions and be engaged at nine oh seven than we are it's at seven fifteen. It's an important topic, and I'd like to speak to the principals. I think at this hour, I appreciate what the superintendent has asked. Um, I think it's such an important topic that we want to give it all the time it deserves exactly. to have an interactive discussion. We're not really actually aiming, at, just so you know, we're not aiming to put a slide yeah. going to have you know, a series of notes that we're referred to, and then we can have dialogue about a very important topic that we're dealing with daily. And I think Timlin's point is we can get back 20, 25 minutes of our meeting mm -hmm. by not always having a standing public health metrics Right. New business item number one. You know, if, yes. if things change, I think our new business number one should be something dealing with related education, to the school, yeah. Or wellness of our students. I don't think it needs to be, although I believe we have a responsibility to be, you know, to the town, we have a responsibility to those kids in those classrooms. And we really need to make sure that we are doing the best that we can to help. We, we can't keep sending these kids out of our school system over the next, we're not going to catch up with this in years. I mean, I, 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 I really, my thing is the mental health of our students is that, we, I mean, I just posted seven children, children killed themselves at WPI this school year alone. They, our kids are hurting, they're screaming for our help, and we need to help them now. We can't wait for this. And whether we remove masks or we don't remove masks, their mental health is not going to change unless we start implementing things that can help. I'm really glad that 
when we're having this conversation, we've been in a state of disbalance for some time. As a superintendent, educational leader, I feel like I'm going to help here. Educational leader, second. Mm -hmm. it, it's concerning to me because our system's still moving forward because we're still spending the same type of time being an educational leader as we are a health official or call us. But we need to, I mean, I switched our agenda around earlier in the year to put school business at first. By the time we started talking about health business, we were tired and we weren't getting where we needed to go. So we switched it back. But my, my hope is that we can lessen the amount of time we spend on COVID related business and get back to supporting students and staff to continue to work together to move the schools forward. And that requires us to spend the necessary time listening and having conversations. And then we, we have not had an opportunity to do that. Before. We've done it, but we've, 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 we've done the, I'm going to use a Canadian term, Cole's Notes version. Right the what? what? <laughs> you know what a chicken you know what? Cole's Notes. Cole's Notes. Cole's Notes. Cole's Notes. Here we are again after throw one in. So I really, I really appreciate that you brought this up, and, and I'm hoping with the direction that we're setting, we can we can settle more into a more balanced discussion at our school community. Listen, I, I agree with all of this of um, why I ran. I just think there's a difference between lessening and eliminating. Right. Um, and if we just made a commitment, um, we're asking the Board of Health that we're going to be in the 0.5% of schools we like to be where the, the mask got mandated. I think getting a quick Overview of public is, health is fine. So, that we okay. have to eliminate it. What I'm saying is, is that we need to start focusing on what we were elected to do. Agreed. I was not elected to be a board of health member, and that's all I feel I've done for the past two years. Well, coming up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not mine. Um, no, board of health is Oh, I mean, I just don't. I don't think we need. You know, no, I, I told no. Katrina this. You know, I feel that yeah, she's. She's doing double duty. Right. The time she's putting in, I'm so thankful for all that she's done over the. You know, I, I think I, I pulled her out of the audience at one point. That's how that all started. And you know, she's done a, a ton. Right. I think it also now, takes I, her some time now. Right, but all, I mean, I've done a quick coverage of it. Um, you know, we can we can bring it down to bare bones if that's something we want to cover or we, you know, we can move on and just see play it by week and, you know, if things are going up then we might want to touch on it. If things are copacetic, then we're, we can just pass on over it. That's, I mean, again, I don't think it requires a motion, but I think for now, I think we can just tell Katrina to provide us the information that she's providing the Board of Health and we can, if we choose to include it a couple of days before, we can put it in the agenda so that we can move on over. So we would contact her on an as, as needed basis? Right. I mean, basically, yes. Yeah. And I mean, I, I know others said it, and I know we all feel this way, like she's not here anymore, but she's been she's been wonderful. Mm -hmm. Like she's been so giving of her time and, and incredibly valuable during this entire process. And I just want to thank her. Yes. And I under, and I and I and I know she understands where we're coming from too. Like it's this is a likely a mutual thing. It's kind of for benefit, you know for the benefit of everybody. Um, so thank you, Katrina. But she's also yes, thank you. instilled the confidence in us to make those tough decisions. I mean, she was paramount in in, in my opinion and, and giving us the not only the <coughs> the ability to make those decisions with good data, but the courage to make those decisions. Having somebody with a, this is an epidemiologist is coming to our meetings made a huge difference. Made a huge difference to me as a superintendent trying to maneuver through all of this. And when I'm not, I, I, I don't have a doctorate degree in health sciences. I have a degree in microbiology, but I don't have a doctorate in health sciences. So it was a tremendous support for me as a superintendent. So, uh, yeah, I wanted to thank you for Sure. Like, Bring it out. We're going to take that out of the next meeting. That brings us to our up to just a denote upcoming presentations. 
Uh, for next week, we will have the school based wellness update and also a financial update and uncoding a grade one presentation. Very exciting. Looking forward to that. Uh, this brings us to our second opportunity for interested citizens. Do we have anybody on the line? We do have one question. Matthew Ridge, you said your name, your street, and your caption, please. Yes, Matthew Rich, 325 Great Road. Um, there's several things. Uh, I'm glad you guys are talking about actually unmasking or at least giving the uh, parents the option to unmask their child while going to school. Uh, I think it's well beyond the time that we actually need to do this. Um, because the one thing is, is that, as has been pointed out, a lot of these uh, situations have been handled in the past as when we had the flu. And I think if we follow those directives, we should be fine. Those people who need to mask up, those people who need or want to mask up should be able to. I'm not saying don't. You need to have the parents have that final say though we are in the state of massachusetts this is where we began the freedom of our country and i believe that the freedom of choice is one of those freedoms that we should still be allowed to have uh the other aspect of one one big thing for me right now is that and i know the information is out there um for the hospitalizations, uh, the hospitalizations are high, yes, but what they did not state, even in, even though we were using New York data, which I don't understand why, um, New York and Massachusetts both have the same issue. Uh, statewide of COVID hospitalizations for the state of Massachusetts and New, and, uh, New York both are at 50% or near 50% of people who were actually hospitalized for COVID, not with COVID. In other words, the other 50% were hospitalized for something else and found out to have COVID. So we need to be very careful when we start seeing these reports out there saying that we have a spike of COVID uh, hospitalizations we don't have a massive spike. What we have is an over-reporting of COVID. We need to be careful with that because that brings into fear. And because as has been said by the student representative, um, that, we, that she is afraid of people who aren't going to be basking up. Well, we need, we need to have people also understand that we are taking all consideration, everything into consideration here. We know that people are not going to be safe. Those people can stay masked up, let them have fun, but let us make a decision. Let, let the parents make the decision on this as well, because it is our kids. We know our kids better than anybody. And as, as Dr. Clenchy has said, the majority of all COVID issues have not been within the school. So I don't know, understand why the fear of being at the school is there because 90%, I believe of all of the issues that we've seen so far have been at home. So if you need to mask up, mask up at home. I mean, I don't know what else to say about that, but I, I really hope that we make it where the, where you actually allow us to decide what our children can do because Thanks, Matthew. I appreciate the input. We got a couple more people calls we're going to take. So again, yep. Great points. Appreciate it as always. Thanks. Uh, next up, who do we have Dorothy? Yes. Katie Richards, please state your name, your question and your street, please. Hi, this is Katie Richards, 3 Cypress Lane, and I just wanted to really quickly lend my agreement to the concerns expressed by Stella Austin. I also have a high schooler who shares exactly all of the same views that she shared, and I think it's really important for us 
to listen to Stella and the other um, high schoolers who are essentially the boots on the ground. Um, so I really appreciate Stella speaking up. That was very, very brave. And your, um, your feelings are shared by my daughter 100% and by me. And I also want to lend my agreement to the concerns expressed by um, Lynn Snow, by Brad Austin, and Dr. Um, Kelly Clenchy. And when it comes to this, I, I hear a lot of people talking about personal choice. And I, I totally understand that's what makes our country so awesome is this kind of a, a ability of personal choice. But I personally feel like um, that public health supersedes personal choice when we're in, the, in a pandemic. And I understand what you're saying, that our cases are coming down, and they are but they're still really high. And so I don't want to stop playing the game until we're at a point where, you know, the buzzer is sounding. I don't want to let up too early because we are in school. Like Stella, my daughter is in AP classes. Even missing three days would destroy her. That would be so mentally challenging. So I don't want to minimize that either. Um, and I also just want to point out, um, I really feel like the role of the Board of Health is really important still at this point because our case counts are so high. Yes, we have high vaccination rates in our town and that's amazing, but we still have you know, significant case counts. So I would like to see us continue moving um, you know, in the direction that we are, that is so successful, but that board of health gives us a level of kind of health accountability. You all on the school committee seem like super nice people. I've actually never met any of you in person yet um, because we're fairly new. You all seem like super smart, nice people, but I don't consider you to be health experts, even though we've all been going through this pandemic together this long. Um, and the board of health, that is their role to protect our community. And our school is a large part of the community. So I really do see a role for the Board of Health still at this point um, in the pandemic. And so I would support kind of these mitigations in, in your motion in terms of the pool testing and even the benchmarks and support a role of the Board of Health kind of working together. And then the last thing I want to say is Katrina has been absolutely phenomenal and I thank her for the time and the effort that she has put in for us. And I think that her role has also been really important. It sets the table for each discussion, for each school committee meeting. And not everyone can get to all the Board of Health meetings and all that. So her briefings have been invaluable for me um, as I listen to the school committee meetings. So I would like to see her continue for a little while longer until our numbers come down to, you know, numbers where they were last summer, when we're not at high transmission rates. I think there's still value in her briefing us at school committee meetings. So thank you so much for your time. I just wanted to publicly lend my support to those concerns. Thank you. Thanks, Katie. Appreciate that. Mike Pearl, you said your name, your student, any questions, please? Hi, Mike mm -hmm. Brew, uh, 85 Taylor Street. I just wanted to thank you guys for having the conversation tonight. I, um, you know, it, I, I had a lot more to say. I know it's late, so I'll keep it short. Um, but given the motion passed unanimously, um, I just wanted to, you know, endorse pretty much everything uh, Justin McCarthy uh, said tonight. Um, I'm in pretty much complete alignment, other than the fact that he did say uh, he would rather, uh, I think, ma mandate vaccines, which I would be totally against. But I think that was a, a bit tongue in cheek. Um, but, you know, I'll, I think uh, I'll save the rest of my comments for the Board of Health meeting, um, but um, really appreciate the conversation and appreciate the motion tonight. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Jennifer Klein, please state your name, your street, and question, please. Jennifer, are you there? Here, unmute. Yes, hi, I'm here. Uh, Sebastian Klein to Dogwood Road. Um, I just wanted to um, echo what was said. I welcome the, the discussion um, today. Um, I also believe that um, the school board is doing a, a wonderful job, um, but you guys are not health experts, nor do I expect you to be. Um, and I think we put a lot of, we're told to put a lot of trust um, into DESI over the last two years. And so the philosophy has been to 
uh, put trust in DESE, follow their guidelines, uh, not because we had a choice, um, and trust the science. Um, and that was, the, we went along with it as long as, you know, restrictive measures were put in place that in fact have removed some of our freedoms to choose as parents. Um, and we're continuing to trust science. And the science says that masks currently worn around town and in schools, the fabric masks don't work. Um, but I'm sensing that there's some doubts or questioning behind the latest DESE guidelines. Um, and so that lack of consistency um, is not just confusing to me, but, but really erodes my confidence and trust. Um, and actually everyone present in the room tonight. So I certainly have empathy for the anxiety um, that's around, um, you know, moving towards a, a new normal um, and removing some of those measures. But I believe we should stop fueling that anxiety and, and rather start to heal. Um, and as long as these measures are in place, we're going to continue to fuel that anxiety. So, so my question is a very simple one. Why the change in philosophy? Why the change moving away from DESI know what they're doing? We've got to trust that process. We've got to trust the experts to now being overly careful um, because we've seen, we've heard about the anxiety today. Um, and I don't believe that continuing down that path is going to mitigate that anxiety. I think it's going to continue to fuel it. Thank you. Uh, I, I certainly can. I, I'm, I'm just trying to tease out what you're saying. We, we are following DESE DPH protocols in our decisions that were made tonight. And we really have been this entire time. Right. I mean, this school committee has oftentimes aligned with DESE's philosophy on keeping the school safe. And as that change as the landscape changed, we've changed. Right. So shoot us an email. Like be happy to talk more. I I, I think we're confused about the question. Thanks, sir. Um, okay, that brings us to our subcommittee reports. DMBC. Um did they set up all the we voted last night they went with it was under 25,000, so they went with that company. Right. High school rooms. High school rooms is on their way that they're moving forward. Oh, that's great. To be clear, it's a portion of the high school room? Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> not, not, not the whole room? Not really. It's a small portion of the high school over the administrative offices, right? Right. So, um, so yeah. just for a bit of clarification, uh, at the last town meeting, uh, the PMBC was awarded uh, a, a, an amount of $800,000 to repair a portion of the high school roof. And that's what the PMBC is moving forward on. So they've got, uh, they, they did a, a study, a thermal study, uh, a visual inspection uh, by the engineers of the roof. And now they have a designer in place uh, to uh, write up the specs. And uh, they will be going out to bid, look for an actual contractor. Um, and the timeline uh, is, I believe, the, the, to get that in process in place so that that roof is replaced uh, this summer. That's what's going on with the PMBC in the roof. Great. Uh, budget subcommittee? Sure. The uh, budget subcommittee has been working hard. Um, Steve and Kelly have been working hard in finalizing our budget. So, um, as some are aware, there's a uh, Super Saturday meeting taking place with the school committee scheduled to meet with um, select board and the FinCom. Um, Matt and myself will be in attendance for that and we'll be presenting our uh, fiscal year budget as well as some capital requests. And I want to thank you for all of your work. We're in great shape and we're prepared to, uh, to meet with the town on Saturday the 5th. Great. We met and basically established a um, the identified the policies that we consider most closely um, um, this board and we'll meet again soon. But yes. we have no policies to report this day yet. But we probably will next. We day. are actually going to be going through all of the policies. Okay. We have to update one more. That's very good reading. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Um, uh, no real new updates. Um, a couple of the 
Um, events will take place in March. Um, I'm not writing, um, but I'm sure they're very important. Um, parent, um, I think it's an autism parent um, training workshop on March 15th. Another thing on March 19th, the Federation of Children with Special Needs presentation. Um, and in April, I think we'll, we'll meet again to um, start thinking about bylaws or, and um, elections. And all, as always, teacher um, parents with concerns should reach out to the liaisons and the um, Winstow's office with concerns. Thank you. Great. This brings us to uh, the end of our meeting. We have a, our next school committee meeting is scheduled for February 10th. Uh, you can tune in next Monday. As you said, we'll, Kelly and I will be at the Board of Health meeting to discuss the motion that we made tonight. And if need be, there may be another joint meeting in between now and then. Uh, we, we, need need session? Session. we do not need an executive session. All right, at this point, I will accept the uh, motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. Motion made and second. This is a roll call vote. Justin. Justin McCarthy, yes. Timlin. Timlin, yes. Jen. Timlin, yes. Brad. Brad, yes. We don't have to say our names anymore. No, I'm going to break it. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Our Russell Street students also participated in the virtual dance.